Yeah, yeah. There's a new thing in town. It's two guys with schlongs. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, starting. Yeah, whoa. Hey. Hi, everybody. Hey, We're here. Everybody. Do you remember us? We're here again. It's another Steve week. And Dan. So, yeah. you know, another week. I know what some of you are thinking. You said there'd be an interview this week. And there is. But not everybody can do Mondays. So it's going to be Wednesday. Wednesday interview. We'll have the time soon. It's going to be a great guest. We got four weeks of guests lined up and locked in. And we're happy with all of them. And we won't tell you all of them right now because we got to drip that hype out. But we're really excited. We managed to get a whole bunch of people from all different areas of focus. It's not just art people. So, like, we're really pumped to talk to them. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Should we say who's Maybe. coming on this week if she can make it? Uh, yeah, we have um, this, this one's kind of a little weird because... It could be this one person, but worst case scenario, we we have backup plans. But yeah, so this week you know. uh, we're going to be interviewing Comic Book Girl nineteen, uh, big YouTuber, does all kinds of awesome stuff. Really great. She's awesome to talk to. I love her. She's fantastic. Whoa. She's also incredibly busy. So uh, she said she could do Wednesday. I haven't heard back because. Some last minute stuff came up. She's doing a book club right now. She's reviewing a bunch of stuff for Marvel. We think she can still do Wednesday, but just in case, we have a backup. And if that happens, we'll let everybody know uh, what's going on with that. But yeah, regardless, it should be Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, she'll she'll be coming on sometime soon. Hopefully Wednesday. If not, uh, yeah. And then ten days after that, on the fourth of March, I won't say who we have yet, but that's going to be a lot of fun. Yep, we got some people. We actually have a lot of guests lined up. We just don't have dates nailed down. Yeah, so, we got a bunch of people that said they'd definitely do they it. Did. So we're excited. But um, yeah, we might well, start doing a thing. Um, maybe we'll make a Facebook group or maybe we'll, I don't know, is right. there somewhere we can take questions from people? Um, yeah, I kind of don't want to make a Reddit because what if everybody no. in the chat conspires against us there? That's a good point. That tends so, to happen. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we should finally learn how to use Discord. I don't know. Yeah. We'll figure something out because we want to we wanna be able to take some questions from people and, and, and we don't want it to just be the two of us. We'd like, you know, you guys be able to ask these people stuff, so get some info you want. But uh, we're back uh, doing a second round on uh, Batman versus Devil Man, Devil, the Devil in Gotham City, issue two, mm -hmm. uh, Awake, Awakening. Sure. Issue three rebirth. Nope. Okay. So the way this is going is we have Devil Man in the top. He's smugly looking at Batman. And uh I forget what he said to him. I had it written down before, but now I don't. It says you're finished like, you're finished Bruce Wayne, and then he says, You know nothing if you know anything yeah, about I, being rich, you know that I have a butler. Yeah, he goes, You don't know the first thing about me. If you knew anything yeah. about being rich, you'd know I have a butler, closest confidant and best friend, and he yells, Alfred. And then here we have Alfred in his his Mecha Batman suit mm -hmm. with his G Gundamness at the bottom. Yeah. And then he's basically telling Batman how he's going to sacrifice his life. And Pitiful that's where Batman. we left off. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, he said something about bat lips. Sure. <laughs> Was it, didn't, did. didn't he say something about Master Wayne, get your perfect physique or something out of here as quick as you can? I'll take it from here. Get your chiseled yeah. body out of here. Something like that. Yeah. Master oh, Wayne, get your, get your well-muscled body out of here immediately. I'll handle this. Yeah, the top one is something like pitiful. I expected more from you, Batman. I expected more from you, Night Wayne. <laughs> yeah. Night Wayne's our character. 
Yeah, Night Wayne is our character who has nothing to do with Batman. We did this unfortunate thing right before the Lego movie came out. Yeah, we wrote a bunch of scripts for a Batman comic that was called Night Wayne. It was a parody. And then the Lego Batman movie came out and used like half of them. Did they use the one, like one of my favorite ones was the crime one about like, I don't understand what's happening because like, like we had this thing in ours where Batman's so confused why there's so many criminals because he just can't grasp the fact that he beats them up every night, but they don't stop doing crime. I mean, what is it about they kinda, beating them up? They kind of do that in the Lego Batman movie, but they do it more like the criminals love crime and Batman like loves putting them in jail. And like, he's not like confused why they keep doing it. He's like, they they treat it like a relationship where like both sides love doing it. Right. Okay. Okay. I still like ours. Yeah. I still like him being at the bat computer trying to punch numbers and figure it out. Lal Woodick says, hello, Dave and Dan. Quick question. When does the shipping of book two begin? Uh, begins pretty much when the China team gets back from their extended new year's break, which should be in about a week or two weeks from now. Um, I'm not sure how much stuff they still have to package. Cause there's like three, there's three phases to getting the books out. They have to pack them, they have to put them on a pallet, and then they have to send them to the port. I know some of that's been done. I don't know how much of it's left to be done. But anyway, that, well, that goes pretty quick. The hard part is getting it on the boat and then the wait time for the boat because the boat going from China to America is going to take about a month no matter what. It's about four weeks to go by water. And then the books that are going to the EU are going to France. So those are going to take closer to six to eight weeks. But once everything gets where it's going, it will ship within a matter of two weeks. It's like once they get through customs in both ports, it ships really, really fast. That was the one thing we learned last time. The main problem is getting them from China through customs, which is where we are right now. But, yeah. Yeah, the whole That's lot of waiting. Mm. Yeah, we sorry about the, for that. The way it's, you know, we fucked up. We, we got way too close to the holidays, and then the Amazon delay just totally fucked everything up. But, yeah, we, we take responsibility for that. We're going to do everything we can to make sure Book 3 is totally done and already printing before the next Kickstarter happens. Yeah. Because, we, I mean, it sucks for us, too. We've had a huge book done forever that no one's been able to read, and we've just been sitting on it. Like, it's it sucks for people that, that bought it that they don't have it yet, and it sucks for us because... Yeah, it's a crazy amount of work to do to not be able to share with anybody. <laughs> it's it's not good for anybody. Is basically what we're saying. Oh, gauntlet of goals. Yeah, I thought we were doing that at the end. We should announce what we're doing at the end, though. Nobody knows that. We're doing it at the end. Talk talk about it. We decided last time it took so much time right at the beginning that from now on we're going to close the stream with it. We're going to do it relatively quick and not explain every single category. But we'll get to that. Yeah, I mean, we wanted to explain it all in the beginning because, you know, it's the first time doing it. Yeah, give people some context. And now we're just going to run through our <coughs> list and our numbers and everything. But yeah, we'll get to that. One thing that has consumed both our lives is Monster Hunter World. Oh, uh, yes. Probably the funnest game I've played in five years, maybe more. What about the last game I the last. Well, Bloodborne was fun, but not like this. Right. Bloodborne, Bloodborne wasn't like I call my friends and I go, let's let's go hunt some monsters, and they go, oh yeah, <laughs> let's absolutely do that. And then like you and a group of friends go fight a dragon together. Like I like mainlined Bloodborne. It was awesome. It's I just loved it. I beat it so fast. I did nothing but play it when it came out. It was beautiful. It was great. I love it. But it's not as fun as Monster Hunter. Yeah, it's super cool. But Monster Hunter is just like pure enjoyment. But yeah, yeah, excited. Monster Hunter's got that addictive nature to it. It's just like oh, you can't. Best. I don't know. Like I, I got it on my um, uh, Vita, like the remote play thing. So I've been mm -hmm. playing it in bed. It's great. It's amazing. It's like that. That might ruin my life. Last night, me and a group of people just did an expedition, which is a new thing in Monster Hunter World, where 
you can just stay in an area and the monsters will keep respawning and filtering in new monsters the longer you stay there and like we just ran around for like two hours killing everything we could find it was so fun it's so fun it's just uh uh let's see question what healthy breakfast would you guys recommend eggs and bacon question mark get into details depends on your diet uh, depends on your diet yeah i've got one thing my trainer has me too and dave's got another i have a uh, ezekiel bread toast in the morning with um some preserves on it and i have a little bowl of fruit and i have uh, one fried egg and that's my breakfast yeah and i do um i'm cutting carbs and sugar from my diet like completely so I just have, you know, eggs, sausage, and avocado. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, from there, just kind of whatever doesn't have sugar in it. I can have, like, coffee, tea, you know, something like that. Generally what I do. Yeah, I always have black coffee with breakfast, too. Yeah. I do coffee with cream. Just a heavy cream with no carbs in it. That's true, Sam. I did make you buy a PS4 to play Bloodborne. But now you have a PS4 to play Monster Hunter, so you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, Monster Hunter is... Oh, <clears throat> it's the greatest. The greatest and the worst. The crazy thing is how many things are in the game you don't know are in the game, and then you randomly just experience them, and you're like, I didn't know that could happen. I've been playing this for days, and I've never seen that happen. And it just, I don't know, keeps surprising me. And Felix says, I got wrecked at the gauntlet this week, hoping this week I'll be less of a loser. Yeah, I mean, keeping track of stuff points out, you know, when you've had a good week and a bad week, and it makes you really feel the wasted time. That's, yeah. part, of the, that's part, of the, part of the whole point of this. I've been, like, uh, a couple of nights the past week. I was, like, sitting there uh, in bed. Like, I make, like, I don't know, I'll make, like, a drink for myself or something. <laughs> And I'll be sitting there, like, trying to relax. And then I'll be just, like, zoning out. And then I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I didn't work out today. And then mm -hmm. I, like, at midnight, I'll go and work out. Just to be able to put down the, the points for it. The diet and the workout are so regular for me. The parts I'm having trouble with are the knowledge every day. That's been tough. And, like, yeah, I don't know. I've been able to turn life. that one around. I, I live my life been tough. Yeah, I had a hard time with the the knowledge one in the first week, and then I was like starting to get back into it now with like reading. And... Yeah, I'm I'm trying to get around it by doing like okay, well I'm on this crazy restrictive diet. Let's learn some some recipes and how to cook things that are good, and you know try new stuff. And I've been doing a lot of that. But it is cool. It's like even though it feels kind of like it's easy to think, I think that it's like artificial to do that. Like, you're not yeah. naturally wanting to do these things, but, like, you know, that whole, like, fake it till you make it thing? Yeah, fake like, it till you make it. I think that applies here a lot, where you're just thinking about it, like, oh, I didn't do anything today to, like, push this, you know, goal. Well, and learning any new behavior. go out of your way to do it. Yeah, learning any new behavior is forcing yourself to do it until it's a habit, and then it's regular, and then it's, you know, just a behavior. But, yeah. You get to the point where if you don't do it, you feel weird, which is like if I skip a day working out, I feel like complete shit the next day. Or if I go off diet and eat a bunch of salt, I feel like complete shit. So it's like you start getting into a pattern where you, you do the things because they feel better. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for yeah. sure. Uh, someone says, me too, Dave. No sugar, no carbs. Any tips overall? I also did that diet a few years ago. I lost 80 pounds doing a no carbs, no sugar diet when I was in college. And I remember having to do that. What are you doing? Uh, so they just said, any tips overall? Do you have any, I'm any not, life, life hacks dot com? <laughs> I'm not like, I'm not restricting myself in terms of, well, I am restricting myself, but I, I let myself have like fruit. Um, I'll have some fruit in the morning or whatever. Uh, the rule of like having carbs before noon, I like, like not, you know, bread or anything like that, but having like fruit and stuff before noon. Yeah. That's the weird thing about the diet I'm on with my trainers. I can, I'm supposed to have some carbs in the morning, but they're not enriched carbs. It's just like, 
Ezekiel bread is made out of sprouts and grains. It's not like enriched white flour. There's none of that in there. And I can have like brown rice with lunch, but then after lunch, no carbs till I go to bed. So it's like, it's really specific kinds of naturally occurring carbs, but I can't have like bread. Right. I can't have white rice. I can't have anything like that. But yeah, I don't know. The Ezekiel bread's good enough that like it, it satisfies that urge if you just want something like that. Yeah, I think that, uh, I don't know. It's really just, I I think the challenge is helping me a lot to keep track of what I'm doing in a day because I don't know. It seems like it, we've been on it for longer than we have. Yeah. It's only been a couple of weeks. Yeah. But it feels like we've been doing it for like a month. Yeah. So like when I look at it and I'm like, Oh, I've only been on this diet for like two weeks. But if I hadn't kept track of that, I might've thought like it hadn't been that short a time like it might have been whatever yeah a month and i'd I be think more the, likely to fuck up <laughs> the big takeaway is like being super conscious about how you're living your life means that you get more out of it so it seems your life seems longer yeah. you're doing more. that's the weird thing is like when you're keeping track of everything and forcing yourself to do stuff time kind of expands like i've gotten more out of the past two weeks than i would have the two weeks prior to that just because of keeping track of stuff also in terms cool. of like the sappiness of it yeah the the whole doing something for someone i love yeah it's in the charitable deeds it's like i'm going way out of my way to like at least like make my wife happy like doing things for her and stuff mm-hmm. and that pays off just because i'm like like wow like everybody's oh. in a better mood <laughs> like, yeah. definitely not that like i have a bad life but you know what i mean it's like when everybody's just like happy you go oh okay yeah. i usually have like a, like i'll do this i'll do something nice like this maybe like you know once a month or something yeah like something special whatever but now i'm doing it like way more often and i'm like oh, okay i get it mm-hmm. in a weird yeah, it's, way it's, uh... <laughs> it's kind of like church <laughs> yeah i can so, see that it's like you're just forcing yourself to get into the habit of being a nice person. Right. It's kind of interesting. It's been a good experience. Yeah, I've been enjoying it so far, too. I actually got out and did stuff this week. It was fun. I was like, oh, right, okay. I like went out to dinner with some friends, went to a party that was fun. I went to this crazy bonsai garden that's here in New England that has, like, 10 greenhouses full of the craziest stuff you've ever seen. Like the coolest plants that are like 900 years old. Mm -hmm. I bought some of those, hung out with the dudes that uh, like grow them and make them all the crazy shapes and stuff. That's cool. Talked to them for a bit. Yeah, it was fun. I did a lot of stuff this week. You know, I didn't put any uh, Monster Hunter into any of my categories, but (laughs) an argument that that's living my life. Had a lot of fun with uh, with you and some other people playing it, but I'm not going to put it in the categories because it's a game. I'm just saying, it was a good experience. I finally found a wine that I enjoy drinking, which I've been trying to find for like ten years. It's called Blau. It's fantastic. It's a red wine. It's the only wine I've ever had that I like. There you go. Yeah, but you just don't really care too much for alcohol in general. In general, no. I really like Long Island iced teas, and I really like <laughs> I really like vodka tonics with a uh, like you know mint or something in them, uh, and that's about it. I really like Cape Codders, and that's like it. I hate beer. What the fuck's a Cape Codder? It's just vodka and cranberry juice. Wow, they gave it their own name. That's what they call it at bars here. I don't know. Yeah, I hate beer. Uh, I like J.K. Scrumpy Cider, and that's about it. Uh, yeah, I'm just not big on alcohol. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, it's good. It Doing is, some Devil Man. It is so crazy how much longer it takes to draw when you talk. Yeah. I I, I haven't been able to get back into, like, that's why we stopped doing the daily live streams because well, we were getting work done, but it was like 25% capacity. I was pretty good at it back in like the Crimson Dagger days. Like I could get something done. Sure. And ever since then, man, it's like once you fall out of that skill, whatever that is, yeah, it's tough. It's hard to get it back. 
so I highly recommend, me and Dave did this thing yesterday, kind of, we weren't super conscious that we were doing it, but afterwards, I felt so relieved. I recommend everybody do it. <laughs> sit down, sit down and talk, and have a long discussion. Either if, if you have someone you can talk to about it, it makes it easier. Everything that you have going on, when it needs to be finished, what you have to do to get it finished, and write it all down and go, okay, when do I need to start? How much has to get done every week? And just go, okay, here's everything. This job has to happen by this date. This job has to happen by this date. This project I'm doing for myself needs to be finished by this month. And go, if I start tomorrow, how much do I have to do every week to get all this stuff done on time? Play it all out. Figure out how to manage it. And just go, okay. That's the first step to getting out of the cloud of I have too much shit to do. Because that's where both of us are right now. It's true. <sighs> We've got a huge project we can't talk about that's for a client uh, that we have to do that's like massive that is kind of on hold till we get some approval. We got to do that. We've got another huge project we're doing for ourselves to put out that we have to start uh, this week. We have the book three um, that we're actively working on. It's like three huge projects all at once. And we're like, okay. <laughs> Like, all right, let's start figuring out how to get out. We're starting to sink into that swamp of overwhelming. Let's start to figure out how to get out of there. It's also good in that same respect. Like, if you have an idea of what you want to do with your life, just talking to somebody about it and having them ask you questions. Yeah. Like, if you have somebody like that around, that always helps to just be like, okay, I'm going to tell you a bunch of shit and just kind of grill me on it. Just be like, you know, what would you do for this? What would you do in this? Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay, so you want to move in this direction. What does that mean? How long is it going to take you? What are your ideas? Whatever. How would you adapt to it? How would you make money? Like, I like all that kind of stuff. That always that helps was, me. Uh, that was one of my good deeds this week was I talked to somebody who wanted some help with a project they're going to start. And I just talked to him for an hour and did that where I just did all the questions of, okay, what is it? How are you going to make it? How are you going to market it? How are you going to sell it? What's the long-term goal? How much work needs to get done? What's the value of this? What are you doing different? How are you going to advertise it? Like, just doing the the dartboard of like, let's poke holes in every single thing so you're completely conscious of what you're taking on. Yeah, it's super helpful. Uh, Goblin asks, "What's your main weapon in Monster Hunter? I can't decide. I, I jump between the hammer and the gun lance." I mean, I use the great sword because it's super fun. I think. What are you using the charge blade? Um, no, I, I I hop around too. I mean, I like doing a lot of different weapons in that game just because it's fun to play around. So between the hammer and the gun lance, I'd say it depends on what you want to be for you, the team that you're with. Because like, I'd say if your goal is to capture monsters with traps, use the gun lance, and from you know wear it down and do different kinds of shells and things or. If you want to be the guy that goes in and kills stuff and knocks pieces off as you go, because there's two ways to get stuff. You can capture a monster and get tons of pieces for capturing it, or you can smash it up while you're killing it and pieces will fall off, and the hammer is great for that. So if you're going to capture stuff, I'd say gun lance, but if you just want to kill stuff and break things off as you go, I'd say use the hammer. Yeah, I, I've been using the sword and shield just because it's, it's fun to play with and it's, it's easy. And then I use like a uh, insect glaive, and then like the charge axe. And I like the insect glaive for like when you're playing by yourself, because you can just fly around the map, and that's pretty fun. But mm -hmm. no. Are you guys still doing any sort of freelance on the side, or do you two pretty much solely funded by Steve at this point? I mean, we're pretty much solely funded by Steve, but occasionally we'll both do freelance jobs for you know clients that we want to keep long term, or if something sounds like it'd be fun. I've got one small freelance thing I'm doing right now, but it's, it's nothing major. It's just a client that I want to keep. Yeah, we're doing freelance table. right now as acceptable comics. Oh, yeah, right. I didn't even think of it that way. Right. As a team, we're doing that huge project we can't talk about, I just mentioned, is a freelance gig. I guess it's not really freelance, though, because like, we're, we're a company that took on a contract. It's not really... It's technically. Sure. I mean, it's like outsourcing. Right. Yeah, that's a huge job that is tons of fun. I can't wait to share it with everybody whenever it comes out. 
But yeah, pretty much like, you know, we, we wouldn't, we don't have to do anything else but make the books, but it's, it's fun to do other things and have other experiences because you, you know, it feeds back into what stuff you might want to do differently on your own projects or like you learn things of, oh, okay, we could do this with the next book that we wouldn't have known if we hadn't done this gig or whatever. Yeah. I think that, uh, there's some opportunities that you can't miss even if you're doing your own thing. Cause it's like that yeah. Neil Gaiman thing of like, does it moving you closer to the mountain or further away? That right. question of where's your career going and what should you take? Like More if, people will see our books as a result of doing this job we can't right. talk about. So it was like a, it was a upward move. Right. So it's, it's like, like okay. we're still, you know, small publisher and we're still like, going through all the growing pains and everything so like it's nice to have a bump like this it's going to make it a little easier for us to move ahead mm -hmm. and then hopefully we can become something pretty real i mean not that we're not real now but dead man's pixel says have you guys ever thought of doing toys based on your ap's or just stuff you like i know dave did some with he-man uh yeah we'd love to down the line right now we're still trying to build the base where it's like we need enough people to know what the stuff is and to be supporting it to make doing something like that viable so we don't lose a ton of money on it. So, like, even with the number of fans we have or Kickstarter supporters we have now, doing something like toys would still be a risk because the time that goes into it and the costs of the sculptors and everything and production and packaging and shipping, it's a huge financial risk. So, like, we might do some one-off stuff down the line that's super limited. Like, you know, there's only a couple hundred of these. Get them if you want them, and, like, that's it. But um, in terms of actual, like, mass producing some kind of toy, we probably would have to wait a while till that was, like, you know, it's, clearly It's really people. expensive. And, like... It's, yeah, it's crazy. We've looked into it. It's just not possible unless you have, like, is, a huge audience. And also, like, you look back in time in the 90s and you go, like, how come toys like that don't exist anymore? Mm -hmm. you know like the really cool ones with all the color and everything like a lot of kids toys now are are pretty shitty like mm -hmm. they're very limited and that's because plastic's so expensive now like the way that they do the toys it's more expensive than it was in the 90s so ca people kind of stop doing it and like if, yeah it's just too crazy if we were to do something like that we want them to look really cool so we'd probably end up hiring a sculptor that could make something we could mass produce in like resin with a lot of detail and like that gets really expensive like really quick to do a like because we don't want to just do a whatever toy and just like eh, it's it's a thing it's not great but you know get it if you want it like if we're going to do that and put the effort into it we want to make it as cool as we can yeah so it's like that it gets real expensive to hire people that are really good at that stuff it is a dream. Yeah. Though. Forrest, you are correct. Uh, most toy production companies require bulk orders with a with a you know, a, a shelf of like you have to order five thousand or more for us to even take this contract. We probably wouldn't go to a toy company if we did this. We'd probably go to like some specialty place that can do a sculpture and make a certain number of copies of it and then that's it. Yeah, but, the problem uh, with that is that like you end up falling into this thing where it's like super expensive to buy it becomes like a collector's thing and yeah and then it's like well is your is your property big enough to even do something like that like does anybody care it's a whole thing it's really mm -hmm. not worth it unless you have like a pretty big base of people i mean just to get into figures for people that might be curious if we let's say on the next kickstarter for one of the top tiers for donating to the kickstarter we said, we made a statue of Steve from this sculptor we really like, and there's only 10 of them, or 100 of them, or something. What do you, like, I'm trying to think of what it would cost to even hire the person to do it. What would it be like? I mean, we'd have to charge the same amount that, like, everybody does for It'd expensive like, stuff. It'd be, like, a few hundred dollars. Oh, yeah, the statues themselves. I'm thinking of just commissioning the sculptor to do it. If it was, like, a really good sculpture, it would be thousands it depends i mean like depends on the deal you work out you can do cuts of the profit or whatever right cut know. them into the cut them into the kickstarter unless you're going to sell it off the kickstarter yeah so like for every one of these sold you make this much off of it and plus right. what we pay you because that's the thing is the less you creative. make <laughs> the, le 
yeah, the less of them you end up producing, the more they're going to charge up front because they're not going to make any money on the back end. So it's no matter what, it's expensive. It's just like you can either pay them totally out of pocket or you can cut them into the sales. It just it gets really complicated. Yeah. Pay them with exposure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Did we pay Brad Rigney? Yeah, we paid Brad. Um, and then do we want to get into that or no? We don't need to get into the numbers, but yes, we paid Brad for everything he did. We paid him above market value. I'll put it that way. We paid him more than Magic would ever pay anybody. Yes, we paid him more than he's getting for Magic because we wanted him to know that we love him and we need him in our corner going forward. We yeah. want to know that at the drop of a hat, if we go Brad, he goes, yes, what? I'm here. I'm here for you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you want to make sure that you don't fall into the trap of, like, low expectations with people. Mm. You want to be something that people want to work with and are happy to work with. And that's the other thing, like, those images Brad did, we're going to use those for tons of stuff down the line because they're so high resolution and they're so cool that we can do tons of stuff with them. And, like, we'll cut Brad in to the profits on those when we do that stuff later, too. Because, like, the weird position we're in is that now we're hiring other creative people to help us do stuff. And we're coming from the background of having both been freelancers that got fucked over hundreds of times by clients. And we never want to do that to anyone because we know how it feels. So, like, we're going way out of our way to be like, what's your rate? Okay, we'll pay you that plus 30%. And, like, if we do something else with this down the line, we'll cut you into a profit-sharing thing because, like, we know how much that sucks to be on the receiving end of a bad deal. So it's it's a weird position to be in, but it's good to have, like, a... I'd say going forward, if you're going to do any kind of IP stuff or making anything, it's really cool to have, like, a little group of, of people you can bring in to work on things that you n might not necessarily be able to do, like... Brad's rendering style and the way he creates images that are like mass marketable is so good to have in your corner. Like right. it's, it's good having that or like we know, we know like uh, blood and chrome and laser hawk and stuff. And like if we're ever on a project that needs sound or music or something, we can reach out to them and bring them in. And like it, it helps to have an extended group of, of other artists and other creative people that can help make your stuff cooler if you ever need their help that yeah. you can trust and you have a good relationship with. You always want a network like of people around you that do great work. It's always going to, you know, end up being a benefit. Yeah. And also just a general rule if you ever get into this kind of thing. And I always try and think in terms of this, it's you this is saying that you get everything you want out of life by helping other people get what they want. Exactly. And even if it seems like a lot of money to pay somebody, it doesn't matter because if you plan on doing something more than this, it's like you just made somebody happy, you know? Yeah. And like that ends up, if you want to be cynical about it, Charitable that ends deeds. up working for you. Charitable deeds did something for someone I love. Got a lot of goals. Yeah. <laughs> it all It all works, you know? Together. Have we considered miniatures or figurines rather than action figures? Yes. I do a ton of work for miniatures companies uh, and Kickstarters that do miniatures and uh, definitely considered it. It's cheaper. Um, again, if you want to make them really cool and detailed, which we'd want to, it's still expensive. Um, and then there's two basic camps for miniature stuff. There's companies that just make miniatures that are compatible with any game, whether it's D&D or tabletop, anything, just general miniatures to use in your games. Um, those make some money. They don't make a ton of money. The stuff that makes the most money is like what Cool Mini or Not does, where they go, here's our campaign. It's Feudal Japan. Here's all. Here's the rules of the game. Here's the boards to play on. Here's all the figures. Here's the character sheets. And they make a whole game, and they include the miniatures with it. Those make way more money than standalone miniatures. So it's it's a weird thing of, do we really want to take the time off to develop a tabletop game? And if we don't, how many people would really buy miniatures of the characters? Because then you're getting into a cross-niche thing where it's, we'd sell more action figures, but they're more expensive. But miniatures are cheaper, but we'd sell less because the fandom for that is smaller than action figures. So you get into a weird balance of numbers of which one is actually worth doing without a game attached to it. But yeah, we have considered it. There's just a lot of factors to, to think about. 
<clears throat> what do you guys think about the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles character design? Splinter looks like he's on crack or something. Yeah, we talked about that ex- extensively when it came out. Um, Is they, are they talking about the movies? Or are they talking about like the Nickelodeon show? Oh, I don't know. I'm, I, I assumed it was the movies. I just figured those aren't super new. Yeah. I mean, you worked on the second movie. Yeah. And saved what you could. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you did what you could. Um, I, mean, I tried to make it something. Yeah. Cool, but I'm not. Yeah, if you're talking about the show, I'm not sure. The movies, I think the turtles look absolutely horrible. Splinter looks like shit. Shredder's probably the worst. He just there's no design there at all. It's just stuff. It's the joke everybody made that he's just a transformer. Yeah, I mean that's basically it. It's because it's the same artists that are like you know designing all the Michael Bay stuff. But it's it's weird. Um, the people who designed, it's weird because on the one hand with Transformers, sometimes they bring in a guy like Wes Burt who really knows what he's doing, and can like design something that's cool even within the visual language of something that might not be great. He can find a way to make it really cool. Yeah. And then they hire people that like designed the turtles for the new one. Who's that one studio whose name I always forget who consistently does the worst work I've ever seen. It's this one studio that does all of that stuff. And they did the turtles and they are consistently the worst designers I've ever seen in entertainment. But then they bring people like that in and it's like, what is this? <laughs> like, what? He's got like a, he's got like fucking, fake samurai armor hanging off his chest and he's got like a sock wrapped around his waist and he's got like a hoodie tied around him and like why like what are you doing like this is just nothing here but yeah i don't know at least in the sequel they tried to make stuff look a little better i didn't see how casey jones turned out does he even have the mask uh, he does but it's really big on him it's like huge yeah but yeah um, the Steve Litchman illustration of Brad was a commission. I thought it was a gift or something. No, we hired Brad to do everything. We'd never have Brad work for free. He's yeah, we don't. We'd never have, have anyone work for free. That's yeah, what we don't hire do. artists to do that. No, no, we hire Brad to do all that stuff. We're gonna hire him to do more stuff. Ideally, he'll eventually have drawn all the major characters, and we can line them up and go look at that. Yeah, look at that. I mean. That's not. I, I get what you're. I get why you'd think that because you know we're like friends and everything. Mm-hmm. But we just like would never do that to a no. friend. It devalues the friendship and it makes your friends more likely to resent you if you have them work for you for free. Yeah. It's like you know that's not that's not respecting a friendship. That's taking advantage of a friendship, and you never want to do that. At least in my opinion, you never want to do that. Um. When Mystic, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it's a signal flare. No, just kidding. For anyone still curious, Mystic's like, it's like a parody thing. Like, it's not actually a game with rules you can play. It's just like, you can put those cards into the decks of any other card game, and you can play them, technically. Like, you can pull the card out and do what the card says to do, but it doesn't affect the rules or the gameplay of any other game. But yeah. You hear that, lawyers? You hear that? Should we talk about that or just leave it? Uh, eh, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can talk about it. Nothing's gonna. We get us. We get a cease and desist from a certain card game that thought we were infringing on their trademark, <laughs> and I had to very carefully explain to them that this game isn't actually playable. It's a parody. The term "togethering" isn't actually a word. And uh, the fact that, you know, we're not taking advantage, we're, n- we're not violating any kind of law because you can't use these in a transformative way with your game. They don't affect your game. They can't be played in your game. It's not a knockoff of your game because it's not a game. It's cards that have you do things with the person you're with, not in the game itself. They're self-aware the same way the book is self-aware. It's a meta thing, lawyers. It's called parody. But, yeah. Yeah, and you're protected under parody law. Yes. You know, if you can't tell that Mystic the Togethering is a joke, 
then uh, good luck to you. I don't know. <laughs> Togethering is a nonsense word. I thought it was pretty obvious, but hey. <clears throat> yeah, the Injustice 2 Turtles, I was shocked that they just went to the 1990 movie, 1991 movie. I was like, oh, all the dialogue they say is insanely bad. But uh, <laughs> it's it's so bad. Oh, but yeah, uh, they look really they look really good. Yeah, I was looking at them and I was like, oh, this, is, this looks good. And then they were like, <laughs> I can't remember what the lines were. I can't improvise worse lines than what are in it. This was much easier than programming. Or what does he say? Yeah, he's like, my name's Michelangelo, and I like to party. Want to fight? That was much harder than coding. I'm Donatello, and I like computers. It's so crazy that you couldn't find a better line. <laughs> what did Raphael say? It broke me. He comes out, and he's like, hey, <laughs> you want to fight me? Oh. <laughs> it's so bad. What does he say? Hey, hey. hey. <laughs> you sure you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's your funeral. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it was really, really bad. I can't remember what his exact line was, but man, it, it hurt. Oh, God. No, it shitty lines like bad. that weren't intentional. No. Because it's they not really like weren't. funny. They were like really, really bland. Yeah, like it's not intentionally funny because then Leonardo comes out and he's like, remember what Master Splinter taught me. And he like pulls his swords out and you're like, ew. <laughs> Strong focus on honor. It's like, oh, get out, dude. Like, what? How did you guys study period accurate armor? If you did, I found that a lot of the stuff in Google isn't something anybody would have worn in ancient times and I want to learn the rules before I start coming up with my own crap. By the way, I didn't teach you anything gaming. Hey, thanks, man. Uh, so here's one thing that this is my personal opinion on it. Feel free to disagree. When it comes to designing characters, cool is more valuable than historically accurate. Something interesting and exciting and visually fun to look at that feels like the culture and might go a little over the top in showing it off sells more and has more appeal to clients than actual historical stuff. The classic example is Viking helmets. It's like, yeah, Vikings didn't have horns on their helmets. That was a thing that came out of Wagnerian opera. Like, sure. But go find any movie or video game that doesn't put horns on their fucking Viking helmets because it looks awesome and people like it. Yeah. So just accept the fact that people like it and move on. Because a horned helmet is way cooler on a Viking than a helmet without horns. It just is cooler. It's more identifiable. It but just damn. looks better. But yeah. What about the historical significance of this battle we're about to take place in? That, that, that's my personal opinion. I would say, you know, if, if that's something you're interested in, find a balance between the two. Because if you just do historically accurate, very accurate stuff, your portfolio is going to look very boring and you're probably not going to get a lot of entertainment art jobs. Because it won't be visually exciting enough. The character is going to be very forgettable because most historically accurate armor might look cool to an artist, but to normal people it's just going to look very bland. Like, you know, like you see like actual Roman soldier armor and you're like, oh, it's just a dude in like a skirt with like a helmet. Oh, it's just but like, not very creative. Yeah, you you can do stuff with that though to make it look awesome. Like um, Romans didn't actually wear the stuff that was in like uh, Gladiator, Gladiator, for example. Like you know, the Tigris of Gaul character, the one with like the the mask. The, the crying mask with the yeah. with like the tiger head on it, and like the pauldrons with the claws, like. That might have been something you'd see in like a Bernini statue or something that came later. That might be something that a sculptor or an artist would depict a warrior as, but no warriors actually wore that stuff. But the creators of the movie were smart enough to go, we should take the artist's representation of the times and make that what the movie looks like because that's more interesting than the actual historically accurate costumes. And that's what they did. And yeah. that's why it's memorable. Like some of the gladiator helmets are 
awesome, but yeah. some of them are like, whatever. But yeah, it's like, occasionally you'll find a culture where the historical armor actually looks cool, like Persia's oh, the go-to for me. Some of the, the armor looks... stuff is pretty dope. Oh yeah, it looks fucking awesome. But in most cases, it's like, oh, that's it. That's kind of forgettable. Whatever. But yeah. In terms of how to study it, look at lots of museum collections. Like, if you actually want to study historically accurate stuff, look at actual stuff from history is the best uh, advice I could give. Look at museum collections, get lots of books that have actual photos of, you know, historical stuff that's been preserved. Um, look at etchings and things from the time. Like, you'll, you know, you'll often find, like, collections of stuff like that, artist depictions of soldiers doing things. Those are helpful. Um, but, yeah, I'd say find a balance where the interest of the piece and the coolness of the design as a freelance illustrator are going to be more important than the historical accuracy, unless you're doing a job for, like, National Geographic. Yeah, I think that the thing you want to take away is the knowledge of... Um, that's weird. I can hear myself. Oh. What's going on? I don't know why. Hmm. Is your stream unmuted? Yeah, no, it's it's not... Uh, it's not unmuted. That's weird. Um, yeah, so I would say that you want to take in the references so that you can turn them into imaginative stuff, more or less. Yeah. So, like, learn that way. Mm -hmm. Where you just taking, you know, all this stuff and making informed decisions based on them. It's the art version of that guy who tells stories in a more interesting way than how they actually happened. Right. It's like when you hear comedians talk about the best version of a joke, where it's like, that might not be what actually happened to you, but you should tell it that way anyway, because there's enough of the truth in it to make it funny, but adding this thing to it makes it way funnier. I I saw a funny comment about that. <coughs> I was sure. watching a Joey Diaz video, mm -hmm. where he was telling a story, and somebody in the comments was like, somebody... <laughs> Somebody in the comments was like, I know comedians who've met him and were there for that, and that shit did not happen like that. He's emphasizing it for laughs. It's like, yeah, it's called being a comedian. And then, like, everybody in the thing was like, yes, it's jokes. This is what having yeah. friends is like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's just what happens. There's a story I told Dave about one time I went to the supermarket. And during the conversation, Dave said, when you tell other people that story, you should tell them that this happened because it's way funnier. And I went, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. It's a very good point. But yeah, if the point is for it to be funny, make it funny. If the point is for it to look cool, make it look cool. That's like part of the job. Um, hi, guys. Are you going to bring Brad in chat for any episode? Eventually, yeah. We love talking to Brad. Um, for the first handful probably for at least the first 10, we're probably going to not do concept art art people. We're going to do other things because we want to branch out from that. And hopefully for people watching and listening, have them start to think about getting into other fields with their art so it's not so internal and kind of echo chambery of like, you know, only artists that do specific entertainment stuff talking to other artists that do specific entertainment stuff. Like there's way more you can do and there's way more places to grow. So we want to like, put a big emphasis on that but yeah we'll probably have brad on at some point yeah definitely um let's see <laughs> basic the rathering yeah exactly uh yeah real vikings didn't have uh horns on their helmets banjo that's a thing do you guys have any thoughts, feelings towards photo bashing in the art industry or indifferent? I used to really have a strong opinion on it, but I really don't care at all anymore. Like, whatever. If, if that's the job, like, I think the thing that made me realize it is I saw, uh, what is it? Sh is it Shaddy who does all this stuff for Naughty Dog? Yeah, Shaddy Safadi. Shaddy Safadi, yeah. So... I saw a thing Shaddy was talking about where he said, everybody should do this because you're wasting your time if you don't, and blah, blah, blah. And, like, you know, if, you, if you're against this, basically you're dumb because this is the industry and this is what you're like. He was given a very strong opinion on it. 
And then I realized, like, oh, wait a minute. That is true, but only for someone with a job like yours, because all Naughty Dog games that you work on take place on Earth in actual places that actually exist. So if you're doing concept art for an Uncharted game and you're in Tibet, yeah, why would you waste the time painting a really accurate painting of Tibet when you can just mash together a bunch of photos of actual Tibet and give that to the 3D people because it takes place in Tibet, so there's no point. Like, if you're making a fantasy game, if you're making something that doesn't exist on another planet or something, if you're doing a Mass Effect thing, you can't use photos of actual places that exist because they don't look futuristic, they don't look fantastic, they don't look like something make-believe, they don't look like something you know, fantasy. But for Shaddy, it's totally true. If you're doing a job on a movie that takes place in Colorado and Denver, then yeah, you can imply some stuff by painting some city shots and things, but absolutely use photos of Denver in the work if it sells the concept of this is in Denver. Why not? Yeah. So I'd say like... It's very it's job a, specific. Yeah, it's a job to job thing. If you're working on, you know something like what Naughty Dog does and you're in a position that like Shaddy is in, then yeah, you're saving a ton of time using photos because the stuff you're working on only exists in the real world, so why wouldn't you? If a specific mountain that actually exists is in the background, yeah, go use a photo of the fucking mountain. Why wouldn't you? It's a public domain. Like, sure. Yeah. But for everything else, I'd say like, you know, it's on a sliding scale. If you want to use like photos for textures and things on armor and stuff yeah sure if you can make it if you can paint it in a way that it doesn't scream this part is a photo and this part was painted if it's visually jarring and people can tell that you pasted in a photo and you're not as good at painting the other stuff so it sticks out i'd say don't do it because it makes the piece overall look kind of hacky and it sticks out if you can blend it in a way where it's like oh okay like you know brad uses some photo elements in his work but you can't tell because he's so good at rendering that he can match it with other stuff and you go, okay, that works. Absolutely do it because you know how to effectively use the photos to make the piece stronger overall. If it looks like you're leaning on the photos as a crutch and they stand out, then I'd say don't. But absolutely, it's a job-to-job basis. So I don't really have any strong feelings on it. Think about it like this. It's like you can do a job that way and you can make money like that. But somebody who only does photo bashing and can't draw, they're not going to create the next Mickey Mouse. No. Like they don't have the skill to design something that's iconic and simple because they're relying on those kind of tricks. And if that's the industry you think you'll work in forever, that's great. But it's kind of like pigeonholing and not really getting other skills. Like other skills will help you to expand and grow into many fields. Where if for whatever reason you weren't doing concept and art anymore, you'd almost have to like relearn how to do everything. Mm -hmm. it's kind of a trade-off where like yeah there's money in it and i've done that stuff it's like photo bashing i've had to do it for advertising jobs and um it's really helpful to know but at the same time yeah it's like very limiting it's it's like one kind of job you're you're going to be doing that and then you know if you ever want to do something like animation cartoonish stuff it's like you better know how to draw right so, yeah, just depends what you want to do. Mm-hmm. That's where you start getting stuff like that shredder design in the Ninja right. Turtles movies we were just talking about. Is the person they hired to design that clearly wasn't a designer and clearly wasn't a draftsman. It was somebody who only does digital art and only does photo manipulation. That's why it's a guy covered in like steak knives, essentially, is because. He couldn't draw a cool silhouette of the character, so he covered it with shit, thinking that, okay, if I can't make something simple and effective, I can distract from the lack of effectiveness by covering it with cool, in quotations. And people do that a lot. You can always tell when someone who was hired on a movie as a designer Mm -hmm. didn't really know how to design because they put way too much shit on the character to distract you from the fact that it's actually very forgettable. Right. And the same thing goes with, like, if you could draw and you were doing photo bashing, then you have extra insight that you can apply to it. And Here's, that's good too. It, it's the funny thing of like, if I told anyone who was a Ninja Turtles fan to draw the cartoon shredder, even if you're not a, even if you're not a person who draws, you can probably do a really accurate sort of facsimile of that character where I could look at it and go, Oh, that's shredder. Even if you can't draw, because it's a simple effective design and the elements that are there are specific to that character. 
if I said draw Shredder from the new movies, no one, even even artists I know from the top of their head without looking at reference, couldn't do it because there isn't a design there. You would draw something that looks like the cartoon Shredder and then put way more spikes on it and then cover the face up and think that's that's kind of how I remember him. But just think about it that way is anybody can remember that design from the cartoon and the comics because it's simple and effective and it's boiled down to this is what this character is versus the other characters. Only the essential elements of his design are here. We didn't put any unnecessary shit on it. It's not because it's nostalgic. It's not because it's been around forever. That's not why you remember it. Because advertising for that new movie was all over the place very recently, and people still couldn't remember what that character looks like if I asked you to draw it right now. But yeah. Um, I know I sound like a total noob, but what is advertising jobs? Movie posters? Uh, well, there's, I mean, that's one form of it. Um, there's all different kinds of stuff, like advertising could be spreads for magazines it could be doing covers for magazines it could be doing an ad campaign for a company designing ads for websites it could be doing a youtube video that's designed to go viral to promote something it could be movie posters it uh, any number of things it could be an app for a phone that's designed to get ads for a company to get more revenue like advertisement art and advertising jobs are is a huge category yeah i mean when i was talking about it um it's for me like i was doing a lot of movie poster work and i did uh concepts and stuff so like ideas for compositions for posters that they were going to take pictures of the actors for and um you know i've done some light storyboarding i've done uh packaging design Lots of different things. I mean, you, it's kind of all over the map. It's anything that's advertising a product, essentially. So, like, just think whatever that is. And, you know, it could be storyboards for commercials and things. But, yeah, that kind of work is uh, for movies when I was doing it. And uh, they required a lot of photo bashing. Like, I did, bleh, I did stuff for, like, Pacific Rim where, like, I had to photo bash uh, the monsters and things like that. Yeah, plus the other thing was, like, that took place on Earth, and it was like, here's a bridge that actually exists. Yeah. So go use that. Like, you know. But, you know, we're not saying photo bashing is bad. Like, no, at, not all. at all. You can, you can learn a ton from it. We just say balance it with your painting skills so that it doesn't look like photos stuck on top of a painting. That That's the worst thing is when it's jarring, that's when it's bad. If you can successfully blend it, it can be very effective, save you a lot of time, and look really cool. Yeah, just always be learning. Make yourself yeah. kind of bulletproof when it comes to jobs. It's sort of like the same equivalent, uh, the thing we used to talk about where people very early on, and I did this too, I'm not shitting on anybody. I think every artist does this at some point early on when they're trying to get better. Um, you don't know how to make a commission look really good for, let's say, a book cover. So you kind of paint the whole scene for the cover as best you can, and then you're like, this doesn't look good. And then you go, okay, I'm going to have to pose one of my friends as the character and paint him because I need direct reference to sell this because I just can't. I, I don't have the skills yet. And then it, it very clearly looks like this is a person I know as an elf with a sword. And then the background is just a whatever painting that doesn't look anything like the quality of the character. And the character doesn't look like a character. It looks like a real person that you painted elf ears on. And that's the same kind of effect you get if you don't know how to balance photo bashing with your painting skills where it goes, this is the referenced element. And it looks way better than everything else in the piece, so it becomes incredibly jarring because we can tell that this is a crutch you're leaning on because you haven't balanced it out. Yeah, unless yeah. you're very good at painting. Yeah. And then you can make it work. Off topic, what's your opinion of games as a service stuff going around from the big gaming companies? I mean, if Monster Hunter was a subscription game, I'd be more than happy to pay for it. Uh, the Star Wars thing that EA did makes no sense to me, and I'm really glad that game bombed. Like, that was fucking crazy to me. Like, I, I guess it's just because, like, when the first Battlefront game came out and the second one came out, me and Dave used to play those in high school, and, like, every character from everything was included in the game, because what's the point of buying a Star Wars game if you can't play as the cool characters? That's the whole reason to buy it. Uh, Oh. So like, 
putting them behind a paywall makes no sense because nobody buys a Star Wars game to play as Rebel Soldier number three. You buy it to play as Darth Vader because that's the cool thing. That's why you want to play the game. So, like, their whole marketing strategy for that made no sense to me. It was really transparent that it was just trying to get as much money out of people as possible. I don't understand it at all. I think both of those games were incredibly boring. They didn't have a ton of content. Like, Thinking about the stuff you could do in Battlefront 2 versus the new ones is like, why would anyone pay for this? Like, it just, it seems like a step backwards for the sake of graphics. But, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of other subscription game as a service stuff besides that, because I don't do a ton of, like, mobile gaming or anything. I'm trying to think of what else has done that. Yeah. yeah I can't think of anything. But yeah, in game like the fact that Monster Hunter doesn't have an in-game currency that you can pay real-world money for, and the game is as big as it is, is proof enough to me. And it's sold like seven million copies already in like two weeks. Is proof to me that the games as a service thing is a choice, not a necessity. So all the companies saying we have to do that because it's too expensive to make games. It's like no bullshit. Capcom just proved that that's complete bullshit. But yeah. I'm really surprised that Monster Hunter finally went like pretty mainstream in the U.S. Like they were struggling with that forever. They just did the thing that everybody had been telling them to do for a decade, which is like what Nintendo's doing now. Yeah. But like, this is the thing: is like, I love playing Monster Hunter. You love playing Monster Hunter. Imagine how much worse the game would be if instead of going out and hunting a Rathalos ten times to get something. You could go to the town and pay five dollars to get that part of the monster. Yeah. It would suck. It would completely kill the whole experience. Cause then you'd go, Oh, this whole day I spent farming this thing was worth five dollars. Why am I playing this game? My time's worth more than that. This like it gives you this horrible feeling of like, oh, that's the valuation of like my fun, like you. And the fact that they didn't do that when it's so prevalent is like, yes. I hated that in Diablo 3, too. Yeah. It was like, oh, you want a really cool hammer? 20 bucks. It's right over here, bud. It'll be obsolete when the next expansion comes out. But hey, man, got to kill those skeletons. I was like, this sucks. The whole point of this game is loot. And like being able to just buy good stuff for real-world money, it just sucks. I think you suck. Well, hey, you know. You know... How about that? Well, I appreciate your thoughts on that. <laughs> did, we, did we get Monster Hunter Online here? I don't remember us getting that. I don't think so. If we did, I don't know. I've been waiting for this game to come out since Monster Hunter was on Dreamcast. Because my eyes are shit, and I can't play Monster Hunter on a handheld because there's too much stuff going on. I thought Monster Hunter to... was on PlayStation, on Dreamcast. It was on, I think it was on Dreamcast, and then they ported it to PS2 and did a sequel on PS2. And then that was the last. And then they took something and put it on the Wii. Mm -hmm. I think, like, I think Try was on the Wii. But, like, it was clearly a handheld game that had been up to be on a console. It wasn't, like, designed as a console game. I thought the only online game that was on Dreamcast was uh, Fantasy Star, but maybe I'm wrong. I I don't know if Monster Hunter was online. I think there was a Monster Hunter on Dreamcast, but I don't think it was necessarily online. But I honestly can't remember. I remember when it first came out, we watched someone playing it, and we were like, this is the coolest thing ever. And then it went to handheld forever, and we were like, why? Why? I want to love you, Monster Hunter. Let me. Yeah, it started on PS2. Okay. Yeah, because I had the first one. I, uh... I bought the one for PS2, and I didn't get it. <laughs> it was very limited online. Okay. Yeah, I tried to play it online. I hooked it up, and it just didn't work. And I went, cool. Hmm. 
Is there any chance that Dave sells his Clip Studio brush pack on Gumroad or something? I definitely buy it. It's kind of my way to support you guys. My budget is tight, so I can't buy the books at the moment. I'm still struggling as an artist, and I know Dave said the dopest pencil brush is in the Clip Paint store. I will look for it's, it. It's not a. It's not something you buy. The brush is free on Clips uh, Studios like download page. All the brushes I use are free. You don't need to pay anything for them. Somebody asked why Ben's stoned. Hold on, I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Uh, lots of Monster Hunter info. Man, if Capcom puts out Resident Evil 2 Remake this year, like they're saying they're gonna, and it's good, and they have Resident Evil 7, that, and Monster Hunter in the same year, I'm gonna be so happy. Because Capcom's been, like, not great for a while. It's so satisfying to see them coming back. Well, Resident Evil was pretty good. I didn't play it. But, like, I know it sold super well and everybody liked it. I think the remake's going to be awesome. I'm excited to play that. Um, do you guys ever do portfolio reviews? Is the Ben question after that? It says, why is the round eye always or whatever that said why is the big eye stoned I mean I don't know everyone had that friend because he's a beholder man yeah as he, he beholds he sees he peers into other worlds and sees things only he can see yeah he gets fucked up that's it he has realizations that only our stoned friends could realize in their deepness back home Let's see. Do you guys ever do portfolio reviews? I'm guessing it's a no because you're super busy people. Yeah, we actually want to get back into doing that. We used to do them all the time. Um, we're going to make a submission email for people to send stuff to if you want a portfolio review and probably start doing them weekly. Um, that's one of the things we want to get back to doing. But yes, uh, we'll probably have more information on that in the coming couple weeks. Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Did you hear about the Marvel vs. Capcom thing? I heard that it wasn't an Evo. Did you hear why it's not at Evo? Because it stinks. No, it's because Marvel pulled support from it. <laughs> they said, we don't want to support this game anymore, Capcom, back off. So this is weird when you think about it this way. They made Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite and took all the fan-favorite characters out because the Marvel Cinematic Universe didn't have rights to the X-Men and stuff, so they took all that, all those characters out and didn't promote them because they don't want to sell those characters because they don't want those movies to make money in a bid to get the rights back so they can make those movies themselves. That was all very political and very bureaucratic, all that decision-making. And then the game comes out, and then Marvel gets the rights back to those characters or they're about to, and then they go, yeah, we're not going to support this game anymore. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, you just, you just hamstrung this whole thing. Like, what do you... Uh, it just must be so frustrating. <laughs> but, I mean, whatever. A bunch, of the, a bunch of the stuff in that game didn't look great. No, I, was, I thought that game was just going to tank. So, some of the weakest character designs and art of any of the Marvel versus games they've ever made really really weird like chun Li just looked fucking strange but yeah it's too bad but whatever hopefully that just means we get marvel versus capcom or soon and it just has all the characters you want in it someone says they love the chunk of hair on the helmet yeah man speed up devil man fucked him up yeah, devil man. Devil man fucking rules, dude. Devil man's psycho crazy. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. If we sound tired, 
It's because we always sound tired. I am tired, though. I didn't get much sleep last night. I only sound tired because I'm, like, focused. Yeah. And that's just kind of what happens. Last night was one of those nights where I feel tired. I feel like I'm going to go to sleep. I get it ready. I go lay in bed. I lay down, and I go, ah, time to get some rest. And then I don't fall asleep. And then I lay there, and I lay there, and I lay there. And four hours go by. And then I roll over and I go, I wonder what Anjanath's doing. <laughs> and I go, I've been laying here for four hours. I might as well go hunt some monsters if I'm not going to be sleeping. And then I get out of bed. And then I play Monster Hunter until I'm actually sleepy and the sun's coming up. And then he goes to school and his teacher's like, <sighs> Yeah. You didn't sleep again, Danny? What's going on with you? Is it this new game I keep hearing about? It's not the game. <laughs> My fucking mom. If anything, the game's the one thing keeping me sane. <laughs> <laughs> you take that away. Who knows? God, those conversations. Yeah, it's not the, the game, uh, Mom. Mom, it's not the game. It's you fucking bitching at me all the time. And then you tell your friends on the headset, don't worry, I'll kill my mom soon. Just a matter don't of worry, time. she'll go away. Yeah, don't worry, she'll go away. She won't last, that bitch. Maybe I wouldn't stay at Matt's house so much if you were such a bitch all the time. <laughs> Matt's house. Family dinner? What family? Bye, Mom. Uh, let's see. Dude, I listened to that Devil Man. Have you heard the Devil Man pump up song? No. It's so fucking good. Is it like orchestra yes. G Gundam level? Yes. I'm going to have to listen to it. I've been listening to that. I would listen to it on here, but I don't want them to mute our stream. Are there any process videos or time lapses of anything of Starvale? I really love the design, and I'd love to see more of how it was made. Do you have any tutorials or whatever of like those style portraits? Up? I don't think so. I don't I mean, think you do either. You're kind of seeing a version of it right now. Uh, there's nothing too crazy about it. Pretty simple, um, and I like the way that gradient stuff looks. I've never used that before. Here's a good one. But um, yeah, like it's it's pretty straightforward. It's just lines, and then it's more about what colors you choose, and then I add a texture of like the paper to it. If you want to make your own story project, and you think you can bring something new to an old trope, do you think it's worth it, or is it better to try and find uncharted territory or focus more on fundamental part of developing stories? Well, here's the thing. There's nothing new. You can do new twists on old things, and you can mix something with an old thing that hasn't been mixed with it before to find a new take on it, but there's no such thing as wholly original anything. That's like a lot of people... I think don't work on stuff or they delay working on stuff because they're waiting for their original idea and they're afraid of being derivative and it's like everything is derivative. There's this popular uh, video on YouTube we used to share around called Everything is a Remix and that's basically what you have to realize is absolutely everything is copying something else to some degree. Everything is taking elements from other things like People said Star Wars was super original. It's not. It's taking from tons of stuff. Flash Gordon, World War II combat footage, samurai, like, you know, Kira Kurosawa movies, like, tons of stuff is in there. Like, Hero's Journey, King Arthur stuff, like, it's copying from tons of different sources. And everything does that. Like, we used to talk about this on here. I think we talked about it a couple weeks ago, too. You can take any IP and boil it down into what we call, like, the three things it's one thing mixed with another thing and then an influence from a third source that isn't super direct and you can do that with almost any ip anywhere in anything whether it's games or movies or comics or anything else it's usually this but mixed with this styled after this third thing and it's like oh okay like once once you realize that you can start building your own ideas by doing that same thing what if we took this but we put it in this setting and then we kind of styled it like this, like 
yeah, I don't know. There's there's nothing totally original that you're ever going to come up with because even if you think it is original, somebody will inevitably leave a comment or say something to you that says, oh, this is just that. And then you go, oh, I didn't even realize it. But yeah, I was copying that. Or, oh, I did see that once and I forgot about it and I'm pulling influence from it. Like, or, so don't oh, be afraid. I am don't... copying that. Please don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or I am intentionally copying that. Please don't sue me. But like, you know, that's the thing is once, once you realize that and just accept it, you can start making things and not freaking out about the originality because there's nothing is completely original. That's where you go, shh, shh, shut the fuck up. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Nights like they say, Dan, you can't, you can't have sex with an old dog. That's true. Not if he doesn't want you to. No, you can't have sex with an old dog if he refuses. Yeah, you can't fuck an old dog. It's the old pilgrim saying. Yeah. An Many old dog old wise won't. hobbit said that. An old dog won't fuck you. Yeah. That's what the troll. That's what the troll said before they uh, turned to stone. You can't suck an old dog's cock without it. No. Coming all over your lips. Yeah. <laughs> you can't fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't want you to. <laughs> that should be the top panel the devil man says. <laughs> you, you can't, can't fuck, fuck me. You, you can't fuck me if I don't. Ah ha ha, Batman. You can't <laughs> fuck me if I don't want you to. And then, foolish devil man, if you knew anything about being rich. You know I can fuck anybody I, a, I want. Yeah, you know that I have a butler. <laughs> And then have Alfred say, Master Wayne, you can fuck anyone you want. I'm here. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. <laughs> you can't. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ha, 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 Batman. You can't fuck me if I don't want you to. I really like that. I just, like, I don't know. I like to think of things out of context yeah. of, like, what we're doing right now. Because I just wrote down on a piece of paper in front of my desk. Like people come in here a lot, like family and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I really hope, <laughs> I really hope somebody comes in here and just reads what I wrote on a piece of paper by itself. You can't fuck thing? me if I don't want you to. <laughs> Thinking you left a passive aggressive note for Kim. <laughs> uh, what's going on in this marriage? Oh man, I don't know what the context of this sentence is. I don't know where that comes from. Even if the smell of pussy is attractive to you, <laughs> I don't know where. I don't know why that was. I don't... Ah, great. It's just a comment. When designing a character or costume for a realistic universe, how do you make sure you have a good silhouette when it's some kind of uniform that a lot of people are going to wear? Um, I mean, pro it's basically proportions. Like, let's think of some good, okay, so realistic. I'm guessing that means not sci-fi and not fantasy. Yeah. I'm not sure. Or does it just mean not stylized? Because, like, M. Bison wears a uniform and it looks fucking awesome because of how they draw his body. Like, they just found a really cool shape for his body and put, like, a fucking admiral uniform on it. You are like, oh, that's fucking great. Like, that's one way to get around that. But I don't know if you're talking about realism, like photorealism, or realism as in, like, this is in modern-day America and not fantasy world. But yeah. A lot of uniforms are already designed to emphasize those shapes. Like, if you look at, like, the dress uniforms that, like, Marines wear, like, they really emphasize, like, the triangle shape as it is. And they do a counter triangle where there's like, you know, the white hat and the white gloves make a counter triangle. But like, yeah, there's, there's lots of little things you can do, but I'd say by far stylizing the body of the person wearing it is probably the most effective way. I absolutely love judgment from the devil man OST. Also, as far as the animation in Starville, is that just done with Photoshop timeline and frame by frame, saved as a GIF? Yeah, that's what you did, right? Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> mm -mm. I wonder if Batman should have a Pantone face or not. Absolutely. Because this is going to be a color comic eventually. 
How do you feel about the rumor that Joaquin Phoenix might be the new Batman? <laughs> he, he doesn't have a face for it, right? Oh, I don't like, know. Just hire John Hamm. Like, why hasn't anyone... He's too... Uh, I agree, John Hamm, but he's too yeah. goofy now. Well, set it in the 50s and hire John Hamm. Yeah, so he looks like exactly. the Alex Ross it, Batman. It, right. Yeah. If it were like a... If it were the Batman I've been waiting for, where he fights yeah. regular crime... Exactly. Then, like, set yes. it in the 40s or something. World War II is just wrapping up or something, and have John Hamm be Batman. It'd be fucking awesome. Like, I was watching, rewatching the first season of Mad Men last week, and the whole time I was like, he could be Bruce Wayne in, like, a heartbeat. Like, the stuff he says, the way he acts, like, pretending to be they're, the guy. They're saying he's, he's, not. he's supposed to be the Joker, Joaquin. Wait a minute, who am I thinking? Oh, no, it's not Joaquin Phoenix. It's um, it's um, Donnie Darko. Oh. He's he's rumored to be the replacement for Batman. Sorry, I, I knew Joaquin Phoenix was connected to it somehow. I forgot it was the Joker. It's uh, fucking, uh, what's his name? Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal. We all know yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal. He's our favorite. Yeah, they're saying he might be the new Batman. <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal, Dan. And I was like, Really? I'm trying to picture his face with the fucking mask on it. Yeah, I don't I don't like him for Batman. Cassine just subscribed with a four ninety. Oh, what? Oh. <laughs> oh. <coughs> oh. <You> okay. <laughs> I'm allergic to cash. He's allergic to all that support. Yeah. I don't have any of that in my life. It's overwhelming. For anyone out there playing Monster Hunter, have you fought Beetlejuice yet? That's not his actual name, but it's something with a B that ends with juice. Oh, are you talking about the Jake, the Great Drungus? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about gang, Great Jengus. I'm not, crying, I'm not talking about the Great Douglas that walks around. <laughs> <laughs> basil, Basil, Basil Juice, or Beaz, Beazel Juice, whatever the fuck name is. Basil, bud. I think, I think so cool. <laughs> Yeah, you guys like the... On page 10 in the Google yeah, search of Dave Raposa interview, somehow porn made it into the search results. Always well. It's good, Mike. It's good to know. I mean, not stylized in a visual way. So, that would be what? Just realism? I guess. I'm still kind of confused by that. But yeah, the uniform the uniform itself can do a lot of the work. I mean, just think about like think about like women's business suits and how they emphasize the shoulders. Like you can do a lot you can do a lot with what a person's wearing to make them look cooler than than they might look otherwise. It'd be cool if they could ban you from Twitch, but not me. Yeah, it'd be cool. You ever think about that? I have. When the, bannings, on. when the bannings come, that is what's going to happen. <laughs> We're going to go, mm, Dan's not really contributing enough. We're going to let you keep taking subscribers, but only Dave gets the money. And maybe Dan will just go away of his own accord. Yeah, Brendan. We caught a basil juice last night. Anyway. Uh, have you seen Black Panther? No, I'm gonna go see it. Uh, maybe tonight. I don't know. I'd like to see it. The costume designs look great. Yeah, um, I haven't seen it yet. I like all the ridiculous headlines I'm seeing about it that make me not want to see it. I wonder if they know that that has an adverse effect on a lot of people, where it's like. Black Panther is the first Shakespearean epic of the Marvel Universe. I'm like, I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking ruined it, dude. Like, I was so down to see it till you said that. I know exactly what you mean. Setting a new bar for storytelling. Marvel's Black Panther is the first true tragedy of the MC. I don't want to see it. I remember the, um, not that this made me not want to see this movie because I didn't want to see it anyway, but there was this one where uh, they were saying about the Magnificent Seven. They're like, it's less the Magnificent Seven than it is the Loathsome Few. 
Mm-hmm. And I went, all right. You have an English degree. You went to college. I went, you better quit everything you you're doing. Writing course. You fucking joke. Uh, hope somebody <laughs> hope somebody finds you in a parking garage my, and bashes your head. It's my favorite thing Red Letter Media does is when <laughs> they make fun of the headlines. Get out of the theater. Like I love that stuff. Like everyone's gonna go for the low hanging fruit. Oh, it's the worst. It's like what are you guys doing? Cause it's like you can't the thing that bothers me about that kind of shit is you can't at the like simultaneously shit on a movie while saying the worst thing ever. It's like yeah. you're no better than no. You're worse. What you just did. What you just did is more offensive than anything the movie did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I heard one thing about Black Panther, and then I saw a clip that immediately disappeared from YouTube that reinforced it, and now I'm more excited to see it because I heard. That a lot of the CG, especially in the final confrontation, whatever it is, is really bad and looks really dated. And I saw something on YouTube that looked incredibly bad. And I went, wait a minute, is this the actual movie? And then the clip was taken down, which makes me think it is. And if that's the case, I really want to see it. If anyone in the chat has seen it, is the CG like really obviously shit? Dude. When he's like... I just want to know because, like, my it, favorite bit of like CG in the Marvel movies that blows is the ice skating scene in uh, Civil War. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. Where they're chasing after the cars and like uh-huh. that underground Black place. There's got rollerblades on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the it's the worst because they're like, yeah. they're showing the camera move with the cars, but like they're running at like a normal pace, like not really fast legs. So so their feet are like sliding across the ground as they run. Okay, I laughed so hard during that scene. I was like, "What?" Yeah, it, it's unbelievable <laughs> when, he, when he skates up to the car, and I'm like, "He's rollerblading <laughs> through a tunnel." Like, what? I yeah. would love it if Black Panther had rollerblades. If he just—that's how he moved fast. Oh, he moved his legs like that all the time. He's yeah, so sh- down. Sh- wow. So the CG is that bad? Okay, cool. I I have to see that then. I don't know anything about Black Panther as a character or any of his enemies or anything. He's fighting some other Black Panther. I don't know what the thing is, but the CG looked awful. And I was like, oh, I need to see this. His name is the... I need to see... see, That's the thing is... Hurt Mongolo. That's where where those headlines (laughs) become the funniest to me. It's like the first true Shakespearean epic of the Marvel Universe. You can't say that. If the final fight looks like two Gumbies fighting each other, like the CG is that bad, like any seriousness you've built up with your Shakespearean epic is gone. The second the CG doesn't hold up, it becomes a comedy. But yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. They say in Red Letter Media that the CG looks like early 2000s. Oh, yes. I can't wait. I hope that's the case. I'm pretty hyped up, actually, about that. I want to see that. It's been like, like not that it would ever be like this, but, you know, the whole Scorpion King thing. Like, I want stuff oh, like yeah. that to come back. Yeah, that was... If anyone's unfamiliar, at the end of the Scorpion King, or no, at the end of The Mummy Returns... I thought it was Scorpion. Oh, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. It's whatever it's the one end of the is the rock. It's a tie-in tie because the Scorpion King has the rock, the right. actual rock, as a character. Is the Scorpion and King the one that was like... Okay. That's the reason I couldn't beat the Prince of Persia Sands of Time because that song plays and I laugh. Yeah, they tied it into the mummy to make it some kind of cinematic universe thing before that was a thing where somehow the franchises were connected. So at the end of The Mummy Returns, there's a half scorpion, half man with The Rock's face as CG that comes out and smirks, and it's like the greatest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, the smirk. It's that and Mr. Fantastic in Rise of the Silver Surfer, I think, where he makes the Hugh Jackman face. Do you remember that? No. He goes... You don't want to marry me. You want to marry a stronger man. And his like rubber face turns into Hugh Jackman Wolverine and like smirks. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, I don't know if it's a deleted scene or if it was in the actual movie, but you can find it on YouTube and it fucking blows me away. 
Yeah, I watched. Uh, somebody mentioned Lord of the Rings in the chat. Uh, I watched the Fellowship again, mm-hmm. and like amazingly, my wife had never seen it, so Crazy. she she like loved it. It's a great movie. I was like, cool, an excuse to watch these fucking nerdy movies again. Mm-hmm. I love it, and uh, that scene it with the cave troll with Legolas jumping on him. Oh yeah, it looks awful. It's crazy how good everything looks. Mm-hmm. Still, and then that happens, and you go, "Oh man, <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> why'd you do that?" It looks real bad. Like everything is so good looking. Everything looks and... amazing, and then you throw. There's one scene with Legolas in all three movies that breaks the immersion. Because in the second one, He's it's where he grabs slides. Is that it? No, because that's actually him doing that. I think. The second one is when like the wargs come and he he swings himself up onto the horse. Oh, okay, never mind. That's not what I was thinking of. I was thinking of the one where he jumps on like the elephant, I think, or something. That's the third one. Yeah, there's one. There's one in every movie. There's a Legolas shot that's CG that ruins all three of them. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's the worst why. CG parts of those movies. I don't know why they had to put that in all three of them, but man. How to cope with the fat, with the feeling that my art is extremely mediocre. It's not constant, but sometimes it just hits me. I mean... How to cope with the fat. How to cope with it? Just make it make it better. Do, do what you want to do. Like, if, if you think your art's mediocre, you know why you think it's mediocre. Because if you look at it and you see that it's flawed, identify what the flaws are and then work on those. So you, at least, you know, you might always feel your art's mediocre because a lot of artists do. That's just a thing that creative people kind of fall into where they never think what they're doing is good enough and that's kind of the drive to keep doing things. So that might be a thing you always have, but at least if you identify what you think is mediocre about it and work on it, you'll have the peace of mind of like, I'm taking steps in the right direction and actively getting better. Like, I'd say just do that. Just try and identify why you think it's mediocre and work on that stuff. Yeah. What are you, some kind of bitch? You want to come oh. in here and act like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm so scared. Do it. Gauntlet of goals. goals. Yeah. Get on top of it. I try to watch Lawnmower Man for bad CG. Oh, I forgot about Lawnmower Man. <sighs> Lawnmower Man is great. Yeah, that's, that's something. It's tool before tool is tool. You think they'd have learned by the nine hours of Bilbo movies. Yeah, the CG in the Hobbit movies is actually worse than the CG in Lord of the Rings. It's kind of unbelievable. there's just more of it. It's not that there's more of it. It's that they don't even try to blend it. Like, the Goblin King dude looks so bad, it blows my mind. Where they, like... I think they tried to like put the actor's real eyes on a CG character or something. What? There's something about his... It's so bad, man. Like, all the stuff with Smog looks great. Why are you such a fucking hater, dude? But all the characters where they try to do, like, a human face? Ooh. 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 No. Dude, you're such a pussy hater, man. I really am. And then, uh, oh. (laughs) Remember we were talking about this? All the design tropes from 2001 are in the villain of the Hobbit movie. He's a... He's an orc who's an albino, and he's got scars all over his face, and he's like blind in one eye, and one of his arms is metal. It's like every concept art trope from 2001 is in this character. It's great. It blows my mind how much it breaks the whole Tolkien universe. Like, it looks so jarring next to everything else. It's like, this is a Mortal Kombat character. Like, what, what are you doing? This looks so stupid. But yeah, throw some scars on there, make him albino, give him a metal arm with a claw. Can you say um, smog? Smog? Yeah, cool. Yeah, you gotta do the ah. You gotta do the ah. Thanks, guys. I'll stop being a little bitch in caps. There you go. Boom. What about Battle Angel Alita eyes? I don't even know why they did that. That's so fucking weird. I don't know. What did what did I say? Um, I dig it. I heard a theory about that uh, that I actually kind of believe. 
that uh, they were on that they were on the fence about making her eyes bigger. And James Cameron said that that's part of why Avatar made so much money, is because the big guys on the aliens made people feel more empathy for them, and that's why they ultimately made the decision for Alita. I heard that somebody questioned him, and he went, "Listen to me." You shut the fuck up. You shut your stupid <laughs> fucking mouth and you make the eyes this big. I've deal. made this. It's my I'm fucking the top movie. grossing film director of all time. <laughs> I love anime. I got my start painting backgrounds on Escape from New York. Fuck <laughs> the table. Yeah. You fucking around. We were on James Cameron's set and I was like, this is where they filmed Terminator 2. That's a disappointment wanted it to be cooler what are you talking about oh the GoPro scene in the Hobbit I forgot about that that was fucking weird did you see the Hobbit the first one I no I tried when they're going when they're going down the river in the yeah. barrels uh-huh. they, they actually put a GoPro not a film camera they put a GoPro on a barrel and pushed it down a waterfall and cut that footage into the movie. So you're seeing those red camera, like IMAX cameras with like 8K resolution or whatever, like for the whole movie. And then when in that one scene, it splices in footage of them going down the waterfall from a GoPro. And you're like, uh, what? It, like the resolution drops. It's like pixely. It looks really bad. And you're like, because they couldn't get the red cameras wet, I guess. They couldn't like push them down in a way that would protect them. So they used GoPro footage, and it looks it looks fucking bizarre. I don't know how they made that decision. Hmm. But yeah, those movies are weird. Can anyone tell me? I'm gonna get on this tangent now. There's a scene in that first Hobbit movie, or maybe it's the second one. No, it's the first one, where they go see the king in Mirkwood, the elf king dude. It must be the second favorite place. It must be. It must be the second one. It's the second one. But there's a scene where he's talking to Thorin, and he kneels down in front of him, and he says, "You think I don't know what dragon fire feels like?" And then he he goes, "Oh, oh!" And half of his face starts to burn, and then he goes, oh, and then it heals again. And I'm like, "What the?" He like comes in front of him, that's pretty and like cool. half his face melts, and I'm like, "What is this? Sounds what cool. is why is what just happened?" And it's Lee Pace, so it's like super flamboyant. I'm like, "What? What is that that just happened?" There's no explanation for it. It's super weird. Anyway, just something I want to know. Any anytime Lee Pace comes, I want to be there for it. It's true. It's a good looking. He dude. literally he kneels down in front of his face and he goes, oh, oh, oh and like it, it's so fucking weird. Anyway, Mike remembers. <laughs> I just want to know. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find it right now. Whoa! Wow. Luckily, I know. Luckily, I know Legolas's dad's name, so I can search for it. Mm -mm -mm. This delicious morning coffee with some Devilman Batman combat action. Wow. I couldn't have asked for a better day, way to start my morning. And thankfully, you're all here to share it. What? I don't know. I found the first part before his face melts. Oh, yeah. And it's unbelievable. <laughs> Oh, what? I'm going to post the gift in the chat. You can go find the video of it. <laughs> I want to see the Seriously. GIF. Just mention I'm going, oh. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll bring it up in the thing. It's literally like, it, I don't know why it happens. Yeah, it that is a very, uh, it's a very cummy face. Yeah, it's and then half of his face melts. And you're like, why? Here's another. Okay, so here's the next part. I'll send this to you. It's from Dan's Tumblr. 
I don't know why this happens. And then half his face melts. And you're like, okay. So he goes, oh, I feel fine. And you're like, what? Huh? Okay. Anyways. If anyone has any questions that aren't related to The Hobbit, throw them in the chat. Oh, someone found the movie, I think. Yep. Someone linked it. Time stamped. Who linked it? It's right there in the chat. Yeah. Lampy5000, thank you so much for time stamping oh. that quality Hobbit oh. scene. So anyways, for anyone listening, you can go to https colon forward slash forward slash u2 dot be slash capital q69 y hey everybody a4 q p g question mark t equals 159 there you go (laughs) that's too long okay everybody this is this is the part where i'm gonna pander to you guys and say that well, first of all, we have an interview coming up on Wednesday mm-hmm. with hopefully Comic Book Girl 19. She does a if lot of not, comic book stuff on YouTube, and you can watch her videos. In the meantime, maybe have some questions to drop. We'll figure out a place to drop them. You can send them to me on Twitter or something. And worst case scenario, if that didn't go through, we have a backup, and we'll announce that. All that being said... I just wanted to say, since we didn't say it in the beginning, that Dan and I, we have a sponsor. Mm-hmm. It's us. Sponsoring ourselves. We're sponsoring ourselves. So if you want to help support us and you want to read our our comics, you can go to stevelichman.com and you can purchase or uh, well, pre-order a book there. They're shipping uh, probably at this rate in April. March, April. Hopefully March. Yeah, sometime in March or April. That's Even if they ship in March, they're not going to show up till April because of how long the boats take. Right. But, yeah. So they're going to ship in March, but yeah, show up in <clears> April. <throat> so if you want to pre order, you can do that. That'll help. There's like between the two books, there's 680 something pages of comics. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's a way that you can help without subscribing and get some, get some cool stuff some hardcover books read a thank couple you, jokes big thanks to our sponsors yeah big thanks ourselves. to our sponsor any hype for the kim jung go kick ass book i don't know what that is yeah i don't know what you're kim talking Jung-Gi about kick ass book is he did they hire him to do kick ass mm-hmm. did they if so, I'd love to see him do comics. So cool. If that's not what it is, I have no idea. I wasn't a big fan of like the DC stuff he did. Like I really love what he does in general, but yeah. the DC stuff he did wasn't. I don't know. It, it didn't have like the right vibe to it. When are we going to close the pre-order window? Uh, probably. I'm going to well, say. Well, once they ship, we have to close it. But there will still be copies available because we ordered extras. Well, you'll still be able to like order it. It'll just ship differently. Yeah. So we'll still have like the thing up, but the pre-order window is just going to be a little different because once all those orders go out for everybody who already did it, then mm-hmm. we're going to ship subsequent orders, which it won't you, take you, too long. If you want the book faster. I'd say make sure you place your order by March 15th at the latest. We're probably going to close them around then or a little after. Um, If you don't order it by then, you'll still get the book, but you're probably going to be looking at uh, an extended month to two month delay because we have to ship all the Kickstarter backer stuff first. And then we'll do orders that happened after that after. Oh, he's doing a story arc of Kick-Ass? Yeah, I mean, hopefully it's cool. I haven't seen the DC stuff Dave's talking about, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, his his comics that he does, like, on his own, are, like, insane. I look at, like, 
like his comics he does on his own are really cool and the big pieces he does where he just free draws whatever I look at those more like fine art things where I just like look at them and I'm like that's really cool in its own weird way like it's super unique it just feels more fine arty like I haven't seen him do any commercial comic stuff before I'll have to look at that DC stuff Yeah, he's he's crazy. And that stuff is so good. I have his um his two sketchbooks that he put out. Those are amazing. I don't know if those are still available, but his two huge books of his work is like incredible to look at. Mm-hmm. That red one's really cool with like the samurai dudes on the cover. Mhm. And I think he put out a new one too. And in Dave, what weapons are you guys running a monster on? We actually mentioned this earlier, but I'm using a great sword, and Dave's trying a few things. Yep, switch axe, sword and shield, stuff like that. I saw people with really cool axes, and I was like, what is that? I didn't realize it was the charge blade, and you could turn it into an axe. Yep. I'm probably going to be trying that later. I saw at a gallery show the sketchbook pages are sold for like twelve hundred bucks. Yeah, that's I actually thought it would be higher than that. A lot of them like James Jean did that too forever ago, where he was selling just sketch pages. Hey Dan, what's your opinion on people that say like you know, like regular American people that will slip into a description of what they're talking about, a little bit of French? Like the piece de resistance. Oh, we've talked about this before, where people randomly, <laughs> people, when people say like Puerto Rico, they go Puerto Rico. And I'm like, <laughs> Yerba mate. Well, it's like okay, so I'm from we're we're both from New England and really close to Boston, so the accent's really thick up here. So it's especially crazy when they're like, "Yeah, so I don't know, we were hanging out, and I was like, I need to get out of here, I need to take a break." So I said to my wife, "Why don't we just take some money? We got enough in savings from last year." Let's go down to Puerto Rico and go on a vacation. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you? That's like more racist than anything. Like, that's crazy to me. Like, I, I don't get it. I don't it's get it. It's like, just the worst. It just sucks. Yeah, P- Piece de Resistance is another one where I'm like, oh, I don't like you. And any anytime I thought I was friends with you, I wasn't. So I was all a lie. I was reading an article and they did that in it and I just had to like <laughs> shut it off. I just closed yeah. the window. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh. oh, it just makes me so sleepy. But I can you do the Japanese guy ordering chicken parmesan for the Wait, for, what? This you, is a thing? I'm saying it's a thing that I like, yeah. We're trying to imagine what other people in other countries do to American food. Oh, okay. So I don't know Japanese, so this is going to be so super you, racist. Yeah, you get racist right and then... They go, Oh, you to chicken parmesan. Exactly. Like, it would be fucking crazy. Like, what? Like, nobody does that. And you shouldn't do that. Yeah, so but for some there? reason... <laughs> <laughs> do that. I mean, on the on the news in foreign countries, sometimes they do. I mean, I guess like I've se- I've seen newscasters do it. I've never seen normal people do it. I guess that's the difference. Is for some reason American people do that. On the news, I've seen like you know, also quite no to the President Obama on an issue of one and they're like, okay, I get, I sure that's his name. I guess that's you're gonna say some version of it that sounds like that phonetically, no matter where you are, but like hardcore Boston accent dudes leaning into Puerto Rico is like incredible like I don't like who do you think you are and why do you think I'm not going to beat you up for doing that like (laughs) what makes you think you're safe because I want to take that feeling away from you I never want you to feel safe again for doing that these are the things you think about but yeah I was having these thoughts the other day I was just surprised again. Of course, it's not racist for them to do it. It, it doesn't. I don't but it's give a shit weird. about that. It's, it's just, just hilarious. It's, we just admit it's weird and funny. Yeah, like a croissant. 
Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. I'm going to have a large black cold <laughs> brew. Uh, I'm going to get the fruit cup. Uh, get one of those yogurt parfaits. And uh, could I get a, a toasted croissant? <laughs> like, no. No. Absolutely not. Anyway, you shouldn't be safe enough to do that. I've got some some weeaboo friends from college who uh, do that with Japanese stuff, and I ooh ooh I don't know I don't even I don't even know. Hundred percent. I ooh I just I can't even fathom it. Especially when it's like when you're like, let's go out to dinner. What do you guys want? And they always steamroll the whole conversation and go, we're gonna go to a Japanese place. And you're like, I don't really want it. Like, we're gonna go. You're like, you just love Japan too much. I don't even feel like Japanese food. But anyway, you end up there. Is that the way you talk to them? I don't even like up... Japanese yeah, food. I don't, don't want to go. I don't want to go. Yeah, you end up there because, of course, <laughs> the weeaboo people only want to go to that. You have to. Like, I was in New York with a group of people, and uh, one of my friends is very into Japan. He might be listening. I love you if you're listening. But every time we go, he always says we got to go to a ramen place. And I'm like... I like ramen, but do we have to go every time? <laughs> and it's just funny because yeah, because Goku eats it before a fight. You piece right, of yeah. shit! I'll kill you. But then when 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 like white dudes order off the menu and they try to pronounce it the Japanese way, it's just like, <laughs> no man, nope, you cannot. It's not allowed. Just say it wrong, get it wrong. It's fine. I don't know. I love it. I wonder how much business like Chinatown and Boston does when like anime Boston's in town. Oh my goodness. Can you even imagine? Like All they must the have business. it marked on they must have it marked on their calendar. Like we gotta hire extra staff. They're like the week. New Year's coming. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm come to buy a new house. Yeah. Anime Boston's in town. Get we're gonna those need stupid <laughs> we're gonna need twenty times the dumplings. Okay, what do, what do they know about? Well, <laughs> they're not going to have sea urchins. You can take that off the list. I'm going to take that off. They're not going to want any of these weird fish dishes. They're going to want dumplings. They're going to want dim sum. Oh my, yeah, I can't imagine the panic of like, Anime Boston's tomorrow. How many noodles do we have? 20 pounds. That's not enough. How many How many of those? You know, like the, 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 the sticky rolls with the cherries in them. Yeah. See, this is the thing I'm imagining is... We don't even the, carry that. We do now. All the all the Japanese people at the restaurant talking with regular American accents because they've grown up and lived in Boston and then putting on the accent when the anime Boston kids come. <laughs> That's what I hope happens because that would be fucking amazing. I can only pray for that. But yeah, I don't know. That's always the funniest thing to me is like when you go to those conventions, the line of people that go to get food after that only go to like Japanese places is so fucking funny to me. Like, I, I just love it. I love that they have to love Japan that much. Like, no, I'm not going to get a burrito. That's not the land of the samurai. <laughs> That's not the land of the rising <laughs> sun. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> Why would I get a burrito? They didn't have Ronin warriors. There's no honor in a burrito. I'm sorry, what kind of animation is Mexico famous for making? I think I'll stick to Japanese food, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Fucking enchilada. I'm going to plug need... something in here. Hold on, it's go, not go time ahead. yet. Um... <laughs> it's not time yet. <laughs> Time for, time for what? Time for me to speak. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to plug something. You know, guys, they live in Denver, and there's a little small Mexican restaurant. It's family-owned, and I need you guys to go there, okay? I don't want it to close. It has the best food. It's called Mama Soul Cocina, okay? I need you to go there. I need you to eat the tacos. I need you to love it. It's just outside of Denver. It's great. If you're ever in there, that area, go there. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. I just had to throw that out there because I was thinking about it. And um, I love that small family very much. And they love me too. And uh, 
I don't have a lot of opportunities to talk about it. So there you go. Describe Boom. your favorite taco and why it's so good. Well, um, uh, I'm not a, I'm not like gringo ish, so I, I don't eat tacos. Gringish. <laughs> I'm not a gring, gringo ish con. Yeah, I agree. Um, Gringish Jackson. Uh, Star Wars story. Go ahead. Uh, Gringo Fett. I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I just, I just ordered carnitas plates. Nothing special. Nice. Your turn to talk. Finally. Oh, okay. Any chance to put these on a podcast app so I can listen to them at work? Yeah, we're thinking about doing that. Now that we're doing like interviews and we're, we're committing to our gauntlet of goals thing and being structured there that is a very uh very high possibility because yeah. we're trying to become real people we're not just here's gonna a, do the same thing we always do we're doing i mean here's a question for the chat but i mean it's the chat so i'm guessing this is a biased answer but still i just i'm curious do you think if we do a podcast thing and we put it up on a podcast app, we should put every stream we do up as a podcast where we do the interviews and then the in-between weeks, it's just me and Dave answering questions and talking and doing follow-up from the previous week? Or should we only put the interviews up every two weeks? That's that's the one thing I'm curious about is like, should this be podcast or should this be a separate thing and only put the interviews up? Do you want to know what I'm curious about? Go ahead. I'm curious because it's a drawing, so it's like, what, what would be the point, you know? Like, I feel right. like we I mean, would just do... We could do the thing where, you know, you can go here to see what we drew this week or whatever, I guess, if we put those up. But, like, this is a lot of answering questions and conversation that we wouldn't be putting up that I feel like is material that we could probably use, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious. We should just do, like, a thing where we have, like, one of those intros mm-hmm. where... Um, we're having like fun while we talk. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. It's like clips of us uh, at our friendliest. No. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I meant like uh, where we go. Hey, if you want to follow along with the drawings we did live, you can oh, click right here. And I if thought you... you meant okay. <laughs> I thought you meant clips of previous things we've streamed. Where it's like that is a good point, Dave, and then us laughing and I don't even understand what the deal with that. And then like you know the acceptable podcast. I hate it when podcasts do that, where it's clips from episodes. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Hi, my name is um, Deffel Monglewood. (laughs) Deffel uh, Monglewood. I run a blog, and this is my podcast, Convixations, Mm. where I have conversations with ex-cons. We should should bring on convicted criminals. We talked about that last week. Did we? <clears throat> yeah, we said, wouldn't it be funny if we could get someone from jail to call in? <laughs> we did you, say that. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. We were like, could Why we get is that someone from jail like a to new call idea in? in my mind? Do an interview about like what it's like being in jail? Yeah, we have yeah. to do that. I'd love to do that. Who do we know in jail? Oh, that's <laughs> a good question. Let's do a podcast called My Favorite Criminal. <laughs> Where we have a ranking board and you vote on who your favorite criminal is based on our conversations. Yeah, with we'll have like, uh, what, like 10 criminals on and then you'll vote. At the beginning we'll go, the year is 1976. In a small suburb of Jersey City, Wendell Thompson is born. Little did he know that 15 years later he'd be going for to jail for double homicide. To jail. episode. Yeah. Then lean right into it. Yeah, I'd love my favorite criminal. That'd be great. World's best criminal with just a leaderboard that you get to vote on. Hmm. I don't know. These are the kind of ideas you got to start thinking about. I'm thinking There's more about value in that. Than drawing. Oh, there you go. Those those scream those scream lines were very good. I got to do more lines. Okay, so I guess we should put up everything. Okay. Because the VODs will expire, and it's way more work to put... I mean, we haven't been putting these on YouTube. No. 
So I guess we'll put everything up. And then we can do a thing where we say our last week, you know, last week we talked to this person. This is what I was thinking about afterwards. And then at the end we can go next week our guest is going to be this person. And in between it can be all this stuff. Man, I would so love to talk to, like, criminals. Yeah, I know. I'd love that too. Like, not in not in a sarcastic sense. Like, no, I definitely just want legitimately to. hear awesome stories. I would just love that so much. That sounds yeah, like the most fun thing to do. There's got to be a way. There's got to be. Oh, there's a way for sure. You could do just it. Go to the go to a jail. And say, who's your best criminal? <laughs> If, if all the inmates to, here, were if on you had parents, to pick, yeah, <laughs> who's your favorite? Let's say the people in this jail are Pokemon. You've captured them all. They all have special skills. <laughs> Which one's the best? Yeah, exactly. Who's your favorite creature that's in here? And then we just have to hope that they don't listen to this. Yeah. Before, because they're dead. If that happens. My brother got donuts and they're in the kitchen. I'm not even eating them because of Gauntlet of Goals. There you go, the beef. Good job. Good. I do the same thing. There you go. I went over. Uh, I went over to some family, family house, my family, and. Uh, family house, my family. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know family house. That sounds like if you were seeing like uh, Family Matters in another country, what they'd call it, like the, mis- <laughs> the mistranslation. The Filipino fam- version, family, yeah, house. Fam- family House, and then My Family underneath it. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they had chocolate cake on the counter, and um, I asked Nick, who was there, I said, hey man, how was that chocolate cake? And he went, oh, do you want some? And I said, no, I just want you to describe it to me. Because that's there the closest go. I'm going to get to being able to eat chocolate cake. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I did, take one sheet, I did take one sheet day this week because my friend Kyle came over for Valentine's Day. We went out to dinner. And, then and I had some delicious it. food. I regretted it not only because I lost a point, but because I always do this. I forget that when you're on a super restrictive diet with only healthy stuff, when you go off and you eat normal food, it destroys you, or at least it destroys me. I was so sick the whole night and the whole day after. It was just like, I can't eat. And it wasn't like crazy, like super fried food or anything. It was just normal food. But like, man, it, it ruins me. Yeah. The good news is I'm not on doxycycline anymore, so I can actually start losing weight again. That's good. I'm on day three without doxycycline. So my cough's pretty much gone. I've got past the pneumonia. Good to go. So fucking pumped to not be on steroids and doxycycline. Yeah, if you're new to this, Dan had pneumonia for a while. For a very long time. Almost two months. And, uh... (laughs) Which is part of why Gauntlet of Goals is happening, because I was like, oh, I could have died. I should probably live life more. You know when you have a friend and you try to help them not die? Mm -hmm. That's what Gauntlet of Goals is. Yeah, exactly. It's just man. Because if Dan gets sick again, then that's well, if the I get, end. If I get an ammonia relapse, it'll be the second time it's relapsed. It'll be the third time I've had it. They're going to hospitalize me, and I won't be able to leave until it's gone. So, like, that's potentially like a month in the hospital. So, like, I did no way. I'll run for three hours a day if I have to to make sure that doesn't happen. Fuck that. When can we spend ammonia part three? Yeah, probably like a month. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. A month at the latest. We should just start a podcast called Murderers. <laughs> just talk to we'll talk to convicted murderers. Man, I'll tell you what I want is more of that mind hunter. Oh, I know. Fuck. Netflix has had a lot of hits and a lot of misses. More misses than hits, I think. But Mindhunter is... Ooh. Ooh, give me more of that. If that show pulls a true detective and the second season's fucking goofy, I'm going to be so mad. It's too good. 
It needs to keep being good. That first season ends perfectly. Yeah, I really want that to be good. Need it to be good. Need that good in my life. Yeah, it was great. Anyways, anyone in the chat got any questions, concerns, topics of conversation, stuff they want us to address? Yeah, we're going to hop off of here in just a bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a few more, a few more questions. to wrap this up a little. I wanted to get more work done on this than I did, but whatever. I'm trying a different kind of style on this one, keeping it kind of like graphic. So it's coming along. It's looking all right. Sorry, someone just offered a job that I might be able to give to somebody and get my point for that charitable deed. <laughs> oh, yeah, so before we go, we're going to do our gauntlet of goals, by the way. Oh, yeah, right. We're going to do the, the overview, brief overview. Where's the best place to see my work? Uh, I don't know, probably... DeviantArt, I haven't updated in forever because I haven't been able to show anything I've done in forever. Yeah, you guys haven't seen anything Dan's done in like three years. Yeah, because I've, I've mostly been doing miniature work that I don't want to put in my portfolio. And then we just did Steve. Yeah. So like we did the Steve books, which was pretty much the full-time job. I did a couple one-off things like the Castlevania shirt that just came out. Uh, and then I've been doing a ton of miniature work and I don't put that stuff in my portfolio because a lot of it is editing other people's work. A lot of work you do for miniature companies is we have this existing miniature already. We want to change it into something else so we don't have to pay for an entirely new sculpture. So then you have to like either take a photo of the miniature and actually paint on top of it to match the photo and do a concept of what the new statue would look like, which is fun, or take the artist's artwork for the concept art before the sculptor did it and then change their artwork to be something else. So it's like, I'm not going to put that stuff in my portfolio because I'm not a sculptor, so I'm not going to put the first one in. And editing someone else's work to look like something else, like, you know, take this work that this guy did. Like, uh, I, I had to edit a lot of uh, Stefan Kapinski's work and turn it into, like, you know, we have these warriors that he did. We want to turn them into, like, werewolf warrior guys. So yeah. change all the head, change all the heads to wolves. Change all the legs to wolf legs. Give them all tails. Change all the weapons to axes instead of swords. I'm not going to put that stuff in my portfolio because it's half Stefan's work. That feels fucking weird. And in the past two years, I've done over 2,000 edits for this company. And, like, it's a ton of work. I, I've done a ton of stuff for them, and I'm, I haven't put any of it in my portfolio. But, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll update new stuff when I do new stuff. I haven't done a ton of new stuff, though. Yeah, so this is how it's coming along. Let me zoom and in. And the reason we don't really do blogs anymore is because it's easier to just talk about stuff here. Yeah, pretty much. So check it out. I'll shut off the dot layer so that it doesn't look weird. In the video unless it doesn't look weird so devil man looking at batman batman's all beat up saying gravelly shit and then over here he's yelling about alfred so then the next part we got to do is the uh yeah devil man's like what <laughs> and then and then we get this scene great with the city and uh, Devil Man looking at Mecha Batman, and then Alfred in his in his like G Gundam bodysuit going to fight uh, Devil Man, and then we'll get to the next page. Yeah, there's the next page. Oh, there's. I thought we were just gonna do one-off pages. I, if this keeps going, that'll be funny though. I think we should just make it so like anything can happen. Like on the next page, we could introduce oh, okay. a new character or something. Sure, have perfect cell show up. Yeah, just be like, not yeah. so fast. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Whoever Our Devil Man's Jura. sidekick is, Android nineteen. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
how did you learn to make all those creases and details in the faces? Those lines don't seem very noticeable when drawing portraits. Any tips? Thanks for taking the time to do these streams. Um, uh, it's more like... It's kind of like a mix of what a few people do. I look at a lot of um, like manga artists that I like from like the 90s. I like a lot of the older style uh, anime kind of stuff. And um, a lot of the details that you put in are just used to accentuate parts of the, like the structure of the face. So like, it's not like a wrinkle, it's more like action lines. So you're kind of pushing the motion. Like if I zoom into Batman here, like really it's just kind of in the same, oh wait, I forgot to turn on that line layer. There it Ooh. is. So, it's less about like accuracy of lines on the face like the way they really would be and more about how does this kind of feel so you're just making something that feels like it's high energy and that kind of intensity adds to that speed feeling and like aggressiveness and um, that's more what i'm thinking so i'm thinking about like how the muscles are under the skin and then i'll make the lines there and uh it ends up feeling pretty natural because it's not like you're making it up. They are informed by something. But yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking about doing that. Do you guys have a plan to go around to conventions like an acceptable comics vendor booth with a bunch of awesome garbage I could buy? Yeah, maybe sometime. We probably want to finish one or two more books so we have enough stuff to like sell and um, you know, I don't know. We might We might do that. We might hire someone to do that. I don't know. We've, we've thought about it. It's just finding the time to do it and figuring out a way to transport all the books. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the gauntlet, gauntlet of goals, and then we're going to hop off of here. I got to uh, add up my total for the week before we get going. I think it's one less than me. It is? I think so. All right, I'm opening up the spreadsheet so I can take a look. 18, 25. How much cream can you suck out of a dolphin's blowhole? Asked Zach Kaziart. That depends how much cream's in the dolphin to begin with. Yeah, what kind of dolphin oh. are you talking about, man? If there's not much cream in the dolphin, then you can't suck much out. If it's full of cream, you can suck all of it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's suck, suck fucking cream out of that stupid dolphin. Um, if there's cream in a dolphin with no one there to suck it, does it truly exist at all? That's a good question. It's philosophy. Uh, I think I gotta open up my calculator. I'm not good enough at math. 18, 25. Wait, wait, whoa. Leave it for all the right. reveal. Whoa, okay. That's what everybody came for. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, you're right. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. But let's see, did I do bum, anything? Bum, 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 bum. Did you finish a book? I did not. Did you have a personal tragedy? <laughs> <laughs> uh... Maybe some kind of masturbation story. No, doesn't count. <laughs> oh, okay, it feels tragic. Yeah, sorry, man. All right, let's get into it. Go ahead. I am going to. We're gonna like abbreviate this, right? So it doesn't take a half hour like last time. Oh yeah, we're just gonna touch on it. Just highlights. All right, so. Welcome back, everybody. Music is on. The gauntlet of goals. So, instead of going all out, we're just going to discuss this. Maybe the music isn't on for them. Hmm. Let's see. There it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. All right. <laughs> 
Gauntlet of Gulls. So if you're not familiar, I'll run through it just real quick and then we'll just talk briefly. So it goes diet, fitness, prosperity, live my life, knowledge, charitable deeds slash did something for someone I love, habits, and then bonuses. Mm -hmm. So everything but the bonuses is worth one point for each day you do them. So you have seven little uh, brackets you can put in a number and then you add up the number from that week with a you know total amount for each day you can get is seven points and then you add it up total all right so let's get into it we both oh actually no you stuck to your diet every day this week yeah for sure i missed valentine's day because i went out with people so i only got six in that category Okay, so in every category that you get a full sweep for the week, you get a bonus point. Unless the other person also had a full sweep, yep. then you don't get a bonus point. So wow, that means I got one bonus close. point? This is going to get closer, yeah. We didn't do this right. last time, by the way. We didn't add bonus points last week. Yeah, last week, Kim, my wife, and Dan, they tied. I added I the bonus points later. I did my workout every day this week, so I get a I bonus missed. point for the I missed yesterday. What about prosperity? Every day? Every day, yep. I had a okay. I had a freelance thing this weekend. I had to organize some stuff for us and I had to put some script stuff together for our uh, collected, you know, put everything in one place. I did yeah, I did a lot this week. Okay, I did every day too. What about live my life? Oh wait, so I don't get a point because we cancel each other out. Yeah, we cancel each other out. Lived my life. I only got five. Ooh, I get an extra point. Holy oh, shit. Can... That's right, right now, just to bring you guys up to speed. We're both 46 to 46 for points. Wow. <laughs> knowledge. Amazing. I didn't do every day for knowledge. I got Neither six. Did you. Yeah. Okay, that doesn't mean anything. All right, and then um, you get one extra point for charitable deeds. Apparently, you did one every day. You didn't do one every day? Almost, I didn't do one Sunday. Oh, no. Yeah. And we both did habits. I did something for somebody every day this week. Well, shit. All right. All right, final, wow. Wow, that was, I thought I was gonna lose there for a minute. So. <sighs> what are I mean, your weekly we can, highlights? We can show you guys a spreadsheet if you want to see it. Yeah, sure. What are your What are your weekly highlights? I don't know if it'll actually show up. Mine were my trainer got me boxing, which I haven't done since uh, last summer. He randomly decided we were going to start boxing again, which is like the craziest workout ever. Uh, so that was fun. Did a lot of that. Uh, went to a bonsai place. That was really cool. Took a lot of really great reference photos. Hung out with some cool people. Uh, went out to dinner with some people, um, hung out with friends, which I haven't done in a long time. Friends I haven't seen in a while because they moved up to Maine. That was a lot of fun. Went to a party, which I can't even remember the last time I did that. And it was actually a pretty fun party. It was cool. It was a really good time. Um, did a lot of work, did a lot of miniature designs this week. Uh, got a client to pay me a past due bill by putting some pressure on them. Um, that was good. Um, what else? Baked a bunch of lasagna, gave it to a bunch of people that weren't having a great week. That was a nice charitable deed. That was fun. Uh, yeah, what else? What, what did you do this week? Well, my charitable deeds is, well, my wife got really sick for the week. So I took a lot of time during that to make sure that I had, you know, everything taken care of for her. And, you know, I cooked meals for her and stuff and prepared, like, lunches and shit for when she had to go back and that was most of my week. Uh, I did other stuff too. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. It was like family stuff because we've been doing a lot of uh, back and forth with them, um, like the new year, the Vietnamese new year is what we were celebrating. So a lot of stuff for that. And then um, mm -hmm. yeah, I kept to my fitness. I worked out every day. I did my diet, I didn't cheat once, I didn't have any kind of sugar, nothing like that. 
uh, worked the whole week, felt really good about it. Um, lived my life, hung out a lot in my, with my wife, did stuff, and we made sure to like get out and do something with each other every day, which is good. You know, you gotta do that. Uh, knowledge, I, I didn't do a ton this week. I mean, I know you, you have a lot down. I only have four. Uh, yeah, I uh, let me go through. I started studying Unity with uh, our buddy, our buddy Jake Generica sent me a bunch of stuff. He made a game called Paradigm. I started looking into that to figure out if that might be my new hobby. Wrote a bunch of stuff on that. Uh, what else did I do? I'm trying to find the spreadsheet. But yeah, what else? Any other notable things? I learned a lot. I've been reading this book called Tribe, mm -hmm. and it's by. Um, uh, What's his name? Sebastian Younger. It's a good book. I suggest if you're looking for something to read, check it out. It's pretty interesting. It's about how like people inherently are in, you know, like these groups and how that's how we function best. And it goes through like history of like Native American tribes and it's it's just it's cool. It's a pretty insightful book and it kind of makes things stand out a bit. And I also heard. Uh, I mean, it makes things like um, that I kind of already thought stand out a bit more. I'm like, oh, okay, that's why I feel this way about doing these things. Or like doing this with you guys. Mm -hmm. So, another thing that I, I learned about that I thought was really interesting that I've been able to apply to uh, a lot of things is um, that life isn't necessarily about you know the end the goals whatever the things that you're going to get to the end of like we're doing gauntlet of goals right now but it's an ongoing challenge that goes forever mm -hmm. and it was this idea about how life is patterns and music it was like this really good um interview it's not jordan peterson but it's a guy he interviewed mm -hmm. it's like a doctor ian something super good interview because the other guy's really insightful and he says all this stuff about how like they talk about how life is basically like patterns and like a dance and more like music than it is structure and how like people fall into routines based off of kind of like that idea and then the way I kind of take that into other stuff is that like that's why you can't retire that's why it doesn't work it's mm -hmm. like you need a routine you need some kind of dance to do you need like these yeah. other activities that keep you going and that's kind of where the meaning comes into all things you know the drive and whatever just to be somebody and uh yeah so it's just something i thought was really interesting i've been thinking a lot about that yeah good stuff it's good my trainer so, told me about a bunch of korea stuff i learned about that we uh, oh, yeah. hung out. he told me a bunch of cool war stories and things that was cool other stuff I learned this week, I've been diving into, because I'm off the doxycycline, I can get back to dieting this week. So next week, I'll actually have numbers for weight loss. And you're going to go, holy shit, Dan weighs that much? That's absurd. Why isn't he dead? But guess what? I'm gonna lose a bunch of weight, and you get to watch it in real time. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, I already lost 50 pounds from where I was, so I'm going to try and get back on that, see if I can lose another 50 pounds, and then down to my goal of losing 100. It's my long-term goal, uh, which would be 150, I guess, from where I am now. Um, but so, uh, started learning a lot of new recipes this week. I got a, uh, joined a, uh, farm share that delivers me like local meats and stuff. So learned a bunch of new diet recipes, learned a bunch of cool new stuff that tastes good that I can actually have made some really good lamb, made some really good stews and things, learned a bunch of new cooking techniques for how to do that stuff. That was really cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Lots of, lots of good stuff this week. Yeah, well, Dan wins this round by one point. One point. That was neck and neck. What is it, 47 to 46? Yep. 47 to 46. If only I had overcome a personal tragedy, I would have been on top. Or, or done one more day. One, one more day. Categories to get that flush point. That's what it comes down to if you're competing <sighs> and doing the gauntlet of goals with us. Points for one consistency. Day. Uh, one day. One day I would have won. One, one day. Or we would have tied. What do we do if we tie? We just tie. We never addressed that. Does just nobody win? Well, I mean, we can do a tiebreaker. We can yeah, do specific challenges. We should do... 
we both have to do a charitable deed and not tell the other one what it is, and then we say what it is, and people get to vote who did the most charitable deed. <laughs> okay. Who did that the better fair. thing? Yeah. We'll both do something without telling the other person what it is, and then unveil it. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out with us. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the questions. It was really Brandon good. Just tuning in. Uh, we think our interview with Comic Book Girl 19 is Wednesday. We have to check and make sure she can make it. If she doesn't, we will have a replacement interview. She, hers will be later. We've got another eight interviews lined up with people we're really excited to talk to. So, look forward to that. We'll get that up. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Yep. And again, if you want to help support what we're doing, we're going to have the, uh, I mean, we have the subscriptions on Twitch and things like that, but we also have our books for sale. So you can go to stevelichman.com and you can check them out there. The pre-orders are still up shipping in March slash April. So thank you so much. We love you. We cream out to you. Thank You're you. beautiful people. We'll see you soon. Bye.